Give her bro. Hopefully. That was a pun. That was a... Oh, I see. We've already started. <laughs> it's the giver, bro. <laughs> Hello, so today, welcome to episode seventy-eight of the Bros Cast podcast, featuring your host uh, uh, Mitch Dick Lick Mitch, <laughs> and uh... and read him off, Derek. <laughs> None of what you've been told okay. is true, um, except for this is the giver. Um, I think our microphones are touching the table, just slightly move oh. yours away. The table acts as a sounding board and sends all sound into the microphone and therefore as, as onto the recording. As you told me, tra sound travels better through a solid object than it does through air. Yes, it does. And that's, so, uh, that's audio engineering back. right there. <laughs> So this is the uh, maybe eighth or ninth or tenth. Uh, I actually, really said that just to fuck with people. So they're like, 85th, what the fuck? This <laughs> might actually be the 12th because that was the goal was to do one a month. I think this I, might be the 12th. I don't really consider each part oh, to yeah. be a new podcast. That's true for the 1984 ones. Either way, this is the A discussion of The Giver. And this mm. time I've done research. Whoa. Yes. I so, haven't. In fact, <laughs> last week you were like, can you watch the Giver movie by the next week? And I'm like, for sure. But in my head, I'm like, that might ruin the whole, like, you, excuse me, you know things, I don't know things, the thing that we, excuse me, have going on here. Usually. Um, and then, like, a couple days in, you kept reminding me, they're like, Giver, the Giver, the Giver. And I'm like, yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. And then eventually you're just like, actually, don't watch it. Because, <laughs> yeah, I text, I warned you when I went to watch it. Yeah. And then I started watching it and I thought, okay, that's pretty close, but that's off. Okay, that's pretty close, but that's off. Okay, that's polar opposite. Like mm. that's that's the opposite of what happened. So after a while, I figured it was going to be yeah, way too confusing to explain what's different. Yeah, I will say though, the movie is good. The movie is good in and of itself. If you're not going to read the book, watch the movie. Okay, for sure. Um, it's just a little different, uh, and I'll talk about some of that. But yeah, we actually ha might have a surprise thing. Like this would be exciting. The thing about Patreon, one of the things that I do like about Patreon is that people who support you. There are polls you can give. Really? Which I think is one of the only things that I want to put behind paywall. Because I, I don't like putting content. I don't want, like, extra shit to be behind, like, you have to pay us a dollar to find this thing. Yeah, but you also don't want anyone voting. You that, don't that's want the just thing. Like, it's, yeah. the, it's, that, it's what Joe Rogan was saying about free shows. Like, you give somebody, you, you say you have to pay a dollar to put this poll in, mm -hmm. and you're now, you're a patron. Now there's a more reasonable idea of you voting. It's also not just like say whatever you want. It's like, you know, are you a reader? Yes or no? Yeah. It's questions like that. Yeah. It's like how trolly can you get on something like that? <laughs> That's and, a good point. Hey, they might just spend a dollar each time to troll us, and at that same time, you're kind of trolling yourself at that point because now so we're you making. You want to give me money. a dollar to put in a quote unquote false poll yeah, revo result? Go for it. And it's not like it's not like an online poll we would be like mandated to follow, right? Yeah. It's just the information. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but anyways, I, I thought this book was about was written by a man because I kept reading it and I was like, okay, Lewis Lowry, Lewis Lowry. Mm. I'm a shit speller because Lewis has a U in it. Yeah. L O I S is Lois. Yeah. So Lois Lowry wrote. Oh, this I think book. it's a patriarchal idea that we just assume it's a man. It's true. It's true. But I say it all the time. I'm like, man, I want to talk to this guy. But if it had Could said girl. if it said Mary Lowry or mm. it said uh, you know, Grace Lowry. Mary could be a guy's name. Have you ever met a male Mary? No, but it sounds good. <laughs> mm, actually, In this corner, male actually, Mary. There's, yeah, okay, never mind. There's, there's, <laughs> in, in Guardians of the Galaxy 2, Mary is used as a male name. Really? In one point. Interesting. A very specific point. Spoilers. I just don't want to give it away. No spoilers. I avoided the spoilers. I wanted to go into that movie not knowing anyone's name, and now I know Mary. So when I see Mary, I'm going to be like, Fuck! When you finally do see it, you're gonna be like, "That's what he meant." <laughs> Fuck. So this book, so she's 80 now, Lois. Uh, she's born in 37, uh, which I believe isn't that the year that Tolkien died? 37 or something like 37? that? 37? No. 1937. No, he was he was around. He, uh, he was around to sell the the movie rights. Oh, so it couldn't have been. But to like the first edition, which was done in like I don't know, fifty or sixty. Okay, so he wrote some of the books did, maybe in the thirties. I did research for the Bulletstorm episode where I tell, like, where I talked about that. 
Oh, really? Like the year he wrote it, the year he oh, sold the rights the first time, I think. He did research. You just the, didn't know it. Yeah, well, fucking two years ago. Because that's the only... <laughs> That's the only thing he sold the rights to, I think, was the movies way, way, way back. And then it was his estate that sold the rights after that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm pretty sure his family hates that, that the movies exist at all. They, they I wanted... wonder, though. Well, someone had the rights. Whoever mm-hmm. had the... I mean, it might be, you know, his kids hate it, but his ex-wife who got the rights or whatever. Right. Like, you know, like, who yeah. knows how it actually went played. Yeah. But uh, so she wrote this book the year I was born, 1994. Ooh. Yeah. So this book is as old as I am, which is 23. Yeah, 23. Uh, honestly, it's it's a really really good book, and it's it got an award for um, distinguished literature for children. Oh, that means it's good. Uh awards don't necessarily mean it's good. That's actually how exactly what they mean. By yeah, <laughs> that's the reason why awards exist. But I feel like it's not just for children. I feel like it's just good literature. It just happens to also be sort of child friendly. And Sorry, actually, that the... wasn't sarcastic enough. I think awards are bullshit. Also, get ready for Mitch's 2017 Game Awards. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even joking. I plan on doing a 2017 Game Awards. And they will have just as much merit as Game Awards by others. I mean, they won't be called Game Awards. They'll just be called Mitch's the, Game it, Merits? It'll just be like, I don't know, Mitch's Games 2017. Mitch cares. Top 10 games! Oh. Coming to you, end of December. Sorry, folks. Rattling in your ear. Don't worry about it. But I'm worried about them. They're I, our viewers. Actually, they, they, they trust us with our their ears. That's really the, the, yeah. the key to that. That's like when you're on the phone with someone and you drop them. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh my god, I dropped you. I'm so sorry. That's why, I always, that's why I'm very particular about that when I'm online with friends. Mm, and not I'm screaming. Like, and someone's just fucking eating. And I'm like, hey... Do you mind? And Can you mute your he's mic? He's like, I have to eat. And I'm like, there's like fucking 20 hours of the day you're not doing this with me. Like, you can definitely eat those times. Yeah. I'm like, you, I've, I'm like, then I like put it on him. I'm like, I trust you with my ears. <laughs> and this is how you feel. <laughs> and we trust these people too. Or these people trust us. Yeah. Also, I'm yelling. Sorry. So, The Giver is about a boy named Jonas. And Jonas... My name is Jonas, <laughs> and I'm carrying the sea. I don't know how the song the world. goes. The world? Yeah. Well, that makes more sense. Thanks for all your showness. This is my book called... Maybe that was originally about Atlas, and they just changed the name. Could have been. No. Carrying the world. Just saying, bro. I don't know. Hey, my name is Atlas. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just, I'm just saying. So his family unit consists of himself... Uh, his sister Lily, who is I think seven when the book starts, mm. Jonas is eleven when the book starts. What's the name of the girl he wants to wash? Uh, we'll get there. Uh, <laughs> that's the Fiona. Only, the only part I remember from this whole book. Fiona, yeah, that's a very small portion, but it's that's definitely just in like there. The way it's written, I want to wash. I wanted, her. I wanted to wash her. <laughs> so his dad works as a nurturer, which means he works with new children. And his mom works New as, children. Yes. As in young children. No, as in babies. That's what they call them. New children. The new that children. Feels like, that feels like um, he's been tracking humans. He's been tracking humans for years. Like, no, not people. Yeah. Humans. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, there's a lot of that in this. This is uh, very much like 1984 mm. minus the violence, which is... you'll And you'll see how that plays out. Mm. So the whole thing starts with this incident where um, a jet plane gets lost and flies over the community, but that never happens. Like, planes never fly over the community. So it's not like here where you hear a helicopter and everyone looks up like, what kind of helicopter is that? Like, what are they going to do? It, it, everyone was legitimately terrified. People ran and ducked for cover. Like, they had no idea what was going on. It's like that South Park episode where all the, um, all the old people are on, this, on the roads at the same time. Yes, at the one hour, and, and they're just going like, to the same restaurant. He's like, get off the streets, old people! And they're like, ah! <laughs> There's even an announcement in the community that tells people to seek shelter indoors wow. until they figure out what's going on. So it turns out it was a pilot in training that got lost. Plus it's a jet. And it's a jet plane, yeah. Like, so it's probably rattling the buildings. Like, there was an air show here in the summer, and the town sounded like it was built, like, on... Like being bombarded, it was scary yeah, shit, man. Like crazy they are, noise. they are like it's basically like you can hear, like you feel like you're right next to it when it comes by, like that. It, it sounds like someone put an explosion like right, right next to you. 
Yeah, and so this happens, and then they figured out what it is, and then there's an announcement saying that it was just a pilot in training, and then it it even denotes that there was an amused tone in the speaker's voice when she says, "Needless to say, he will be released." You go on uh, so to find, you, so you know he's not. You know, going to be released. No, released is their term for euthanizing people. Oh, shit. You don't actually find this out until much, much later in the book, but to any adult reading it. Right. So Jonas thinks release, actually all the people in the community think that release means that you get released from the community to quote unquote elsewhere. Mm. But they don't know like where else, they don't know what that means. So when she says he'll be released, everyone's like, oh, that sucks. But they're not really thinking about it the same way. Mm. It's a disgrace, but it's not. It's almost actually like in 1984 when people just disappear. Right. It's kind of like that. They just get lifted out of the world. So Jonas remembers being frightened about the plane, and he's trying to... They don't have words for emotions, right? Their, their emotions are like, do you like this? Do you not like this? Like, they don't... Love isn't a word. Mm. Um, it, you know, even things like, do you enjoy something? That You have to use very precise language it's actually one of the rules right and they'll they'll get on you like if you say something that's imprecise they'll actually whack you with a discipline wand when you're a kid a discipline wand yeah spell the wand spoil the child yeah so he's trying to figure out how he feels about uh when he turns 12 they get job selection and job selection is actually job assignment in this community so jonas becomes a delivery man meets a robot named bender Yes, I was Jonas like, becomes Fry. I was fry. like working pretty hard to make that into something else, but no, nah, I couldn't do it. No, Sorry. not really. Thanks so, for all your show. Anyway, go ahead. This is actually where, um, this is one of the few points I'm going to touch on the, the movie. In the movie, he says he's afraid and he's terrified of the job selection. Hmm. But in the book, he very specifically says, I remember being afraid when the plane was around and I'm not afraid now. Like, I'm, he knows he doesn't feel afraid. It's another feeling. But in the movie, they're like, ah, fear's an easier one. Like, just make them afraid. People understand that. But the po- isn't the point of, of this society is that they don't have normal emotions or at all? Exactly. And so the movie put emotions into it? Yeah, the movie definitely took a lot of liberties with it that, like I said, it's a good approximation of the book if you're not going to read it, but it's not nearly as good. Mm. It's the same as um, Frankenstein. Where they just did some things, and you just look at them, and you think, what was the purpose? Well, because a story should have a point. You know, like, have you seen um, Punch Drunk Love? Mm-mm. I have not. But I've watched a really great, I think it, I think it was, oh, fuck, there's too many names out there, man. It's something about Elk, Entertain the Elk. That's the name of the YouTube channel. It's really good. He, he, he gets very specific about movie and television and... and the brilliance of certain directors and he talks about punch drunk love and the way how everything in the scene is intentional it's all uh covert meanings so the character adam sandler is is um, addicted to a phone sex line he also has an issue with social anxiety and his sister and his job and so there's scenes where his sister is pushing him to go out with this girl. So that's two things right there. His sister and the social anxiety. The phone is ringing at the same time, which represents this phone sex line. Mm -hmm. And in the background behind the picture is people fucking, like some shit falling on someone at work. So it's four, all the four things that are the worst things in his life happening at the same time. And the scene is so well put together that without realizing it, you feel the same anxiety that the character feels. Because it's too much to take in. And that's one of those examples of a movie that is has such an intention that a lot of people just didn't get it. They're mm. like, this is a boring movie. But it's because this person's not ramming it in your face. Adam Sandler isn't sitting there telling you, I don't like my sister, social anxiety, work, and phone sex line problems. Yeah, well, also in the book, Jonas becomes more and more isolated from his peers because they don't understand him. Whereas in the movies, Jonas becomes more and more entangled with his peers Mm. as he tries to bring them into his world. Like, he tries to help them break the rules and shit. Like, it's just totally polar opposite because they just didn't get it. Honestly, the same as the people who made the Frankenstein movies. They just didn't get what the essence of the story was. So let me give you an example of how weird the society is. So Asher shows up late to class. Asher? Don't just breeze by that. (laughs) So Ash, I assumed if you knew Fiona, you knew Asher. <laughs> no, I don't remember okay. that. 
So he has. So there really is. There's three friends: Fiona, Jonas, and Asher. They're mm. like a group of friends, um, and I'm pretty sure they're all the same age. They're all 11s. So Ugh. yeah, so they're 11s, which doesn't actually mean they're 11 years old. So when a baby is born between January and December, I mean, I mean they don't use months, but I'm pretending that. Mm. Anyways, when a baby is born in that year. At the end of that year, all the babies that are determined to be mature enough to be given to a family are given to a family, whereas the ones that aren't mature enough are either held back or released. So as soon as the child is given to a family, it becomes a one. So not all the kids are one years old when they become a one. Mm. And then every year you advance to a two, three, four, five. So that way, there's no different ages. There isn't like, I'm slightly older than you, even though we're the same grade. There are no grades. There's years. Whoa. Yeah. So Jonas is an 11, which means he's probably 11 and a half or 12. Wow. Yeah. Um, so kids in Canada would read this when they're nines. Yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Asher comes into class late and he says, I apologize to my classmates. And then they say, we accept your apology, Asher. And then the teacher says, I accept your apology, Asher. Mm. Every single thing that you do, you must apologize, and people must accept your apology verbally. Mm. Both of those things have to happen. It is it's ubiquitous. Like you get you get punished if you don't do that Whoa. with the discipline <clears throat> wand. We shall discipline them. <laughs> when, when I was in grade five, there was a kid reading this book, and we had this. They, they were like, the the preschool kids are coming by for a for a, a class and you guys are going to read to them. And this one kid's like, I might read them the giver and just scare the shit out of them. <laughs> That's awesome. Cause it is the thing is it's psychologically terrifying. It's not uh it's not horror, it's terror. Yeah. So kids wouldn't even get it necessarily. Oh no, no. What he said was he's like, I don't think I should read my book to the kids because oh, oh, it might scare it the might shit out of them. Oh, because it might scare them. Yeah, yeah. yeah it and might. She's like, no, 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 we'll provide Yeah, books. we'll give you books. Thomas the Tank Engine and shit like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Wait. Jack and that Joe. That was a book, right? Thomas, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. it started, isn't it? Yeah, 100%. And then it became a TV show. I think I With can. With a I think I can. banging theme song. Yes. It's probably one of my and favorite theme creepy songs. creepy eyes. Yes. The trains have really creepy eyes. Have you heard eyes. the theory about Thomas the Tank Engine's world? No. That the tank engines are like... They're slaves to humans. They're like a sub. They're, they're like a, a race that's treated like a, a, a second a class, subjugated race. Yeah, and they like because there's like broken down um, trains in the background of those of those shows, right? Yeah, and it's like those are supposed to be like the corpses like of to, trains to yeah. remind the ones that are living like what's at stake here. It's like in Game of Thrones, where they put the, the dead slaves every kilometer oh, yeah. on the trail to the city Fuck. to warn those. Yeah, it's a dark, dark show. shit, man. So Asher actually gets uh, reprimanded because he was saying he got distraught by watching the fishermen. Mm. I meant distracted. Mm. Because Asher, it's funny, most people use imprecise language, meaning they'll say things like, I was starving today. But no, you were hungry. If you were mm. starving, you would be on the brink of death. Right. Asher is just either stupid or illiterate. I don't know. I, I'm sure he just has speech issues. Mm. But it's just he'll just say words that just are not applicable. It's like this guy I know who instead of saying liable, as in you are liable for the damages, he says reliable. <laughs> so he says, hey, man, I don't want to be reliable for that. <laughs> and he says it every time. We, we can't correct him. Have you heard DJ Khaled say jewelry? No. Jewelry? Jewelry? It's something like that. Ugh. Or, um, or uh, I, I like to be accurate on this. Sorry, what? Accurate. Accurate? Accurate. Wow, that's a new one. I don't think a U can be pronounced as an I, but... Hey, man. Oh, my God. Anything's possible. Uh, so Jonas goes home after class, and they do the evening feeling share at the family table. <sighs> sorry, give me a second. <laughs> sorry, just... Uh, just uh, Sorry, just give me... Just, uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> so Jonas re doesn't usually share in the first place. Mm. So it's not unusual for him to not want he's, to share. He's carrying the world, right? So that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And his name is Jonas. Mm. So... Is it? His name is Jonas. Is it Jonas Blaine? Oh my God, this would be a much better book if it was Jonas, Jonas Blaine. Jonas Blaine. He's uh, Dennis Haysbert. It, um, it plays Jonas Blaine on the unit. Oh, oh. The snake Doc. Oh, jeez. He would just kill everybody. They don't have any weapons or yeah. anything. He dude, would... dude, this is a fucking episode where he intentionally gets captured. 
frees himself with no weapon and kills like fucking 12 dudes with their guns. You imagine how much better this book would be? That's the principle with behind Jonas in the there? mercenaries games. Yeah. You know, why provide machinery and munitions when the enemy will bring it to you? Exactly. And you could just use it on yeah. them. So uh, his little sister Lily shares this story about how she was angry with another group of sevens that came to visit them. Mm. And the other group of sevens, I guess, comes from a different community. And one of the kids was like butting in line. And butting in line is like really bad in this community. No butts. Even though it seems like no, no butts, butts, no cuts, no what's the last one? No interrupts? Is that? I don't know. I think I... it's no butts, no cuts, no interrupts. But every time I do it in my head, I go no butts, no cuts, no budget cuts. And I'm like, no, <laughs> no, that's totally not it. <laughs> I think it's interrupts. <laughs> and so the whole family is, is kind of saying like, you know, why... You know, why do you think they did that? Maybe they don't understand. And they, like, taught Lily a thing about, like, understanding. Mm. And uh, and then Jonas calls the other kids animals. And this is the weird part. They, as a society, don't know that animals exist. They use the term animals to mean, like, those who are uneducated or oh. clumsy. Like, you know how we would be like, you fucking animal. Well, I, sometimes I use it as a term of endearment where it's like Conor McGregor is a fucking animal, oh, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. But yeah, they use it as a derogatory term and they don't even realize they're real. I, I always find that it's kind of a weird statement because we actually are animals. Yes. Like we're actually, part of the animal kingdom. It's true. Has mammals and that's us right there. We're like... Well, it's basically... We're literally animals. It's it's saying by not separating yourself from the way other animals behave, mm. you are a lesser, is like kind of the implication. Well, in, in the early 2000s, I, I don't know what movie, or what show it was on TV, but there was a woman who said that it's the, the human brain tricks us into believing that we're not like the other animals. Yeah, that's our greatest ability. Yeah. <laughs> Trick ourselves. <laughs> so the funny thing I thought about this book was they, they taught Lily tolerance in three quarters of a page. There's this, like, little conversation, and after it, she's, like, tolerant all of a sudden. And I was like, oh, wow, that was... Took you seven years to have this one three-quarter page conversation? Still better than the fucking jump from Anakin. Oh. An fucking 11 minutes or something like that? Yeah, like 11 minutes, minutes, I'm going to kill all the children. Yeah. <laughs> Just, like, he went from, like, I want to do the best to I want to kill the children so that I can save my wife? Don't know how that works. Yeah. So, Lily is kind of the polar opposite of Jonas in this story. Lily's emotions are always really straightforward. Mm. She's happy, sad, whatever. Like it, It's always linear and has a reason. Jonas is always confused. The mm. whole book. They're never really able to like figure out how he feels about things. Which is why he's the protagonist, because it wouldn't be nearly as interesting. If, if he, he was, had straightforward emotions. Like, Hermione is a great character, but she wouldn't be the, a good lead. No, definitely not. Because it would just be like the story of that time that she stayed in and studied. And studied books. Yeah, <laughs> no, exactly. Just like a montage of like, boom, boom, chicka, boom, boom, chicka, boom, boom, chicka, 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 and she's just like turning all done to pages. dubstep music. Like, oh wow! And like the... sometimes Ron comes in and she just <laughs> paralyzes him so he can't interrupt her. Dude, it's like it's like building up. It's like boom boom chicka, boom pa, chicka, boom 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 boom. Psh. As she's like walking down the stairs with a book, and she drops the book, and it opens right as the drop of the beat comes, and it's like brow. As she's like turning pages. pages. <laughs> It's like it's those weird like CSI shots where it's like slowly coming in on them and then it quickly pans around to like then a slow motion shot of her moving. Okay, anyway, go ahead. So that would make a, a quarter of a movie maybe. <laughs> maybe like a tenth of a movie. It could be a good off movie. A one-off, yeah, yeah. Like um, a little tiny snippet, yeah. a little vignette. So the father starts talking about this newborn. You remember how I said if newborns struggle, they get either released or held back? Mm. So there's a newborn that's struggling – and he wants to bring the newborn home mm. because the night crew is like having huge issues and a kid won't sleep and shit. Mm. So that's like the first mention of the the newborn child that won't just won't sleep. <laughs> I can imagine this, a lot of parents. I'm gonna forget this. Are you aware of a book? Um, I think it's called The Second Child or The Third Child. Probably The Second Child. It's a book. About yes, a world where you can only have two children. I think it's only one. Oh, really? Might be two. I thought it was just two children you could have, and then the third one was like the outlaw child. Yeah. That have you heard of that? Is actually super common, believe it or not. Oh, I know it, it happens in other countries. Is it, this, this one is like in, set in a dystopian future? No, sorry. I meant that's really common in books. 
Oh. Ender's Game, that's the rule. Really? You can only have two children, and you're only permitted to have a third child if it's necessary for, like, a government program. That's where Ender is born as the third child mm. because his parents were some sort of, like, special people, and so they were chosen to breed military children. Hmm. Yeah. So it's actually, yeah, a really common trope that, and, and in this one. Family units only get a boy and a girl. Every family unit gets one boy, one girl. Mm, but you're aware of that book, right? Honestly, I don't know. That it. would be a good one to bring. Okay. It's really the good. The third child or yeah. the second child? It's like surprising where the story goes. Okay. Because you read it a long time ago. In grade four. I was an eight. Okay. And that's actually. No. Just, you were a nine. In grade, grade four, you would have been a nine. Oh, so, so then you would have been a, a ten. Nine. No, a ten. A ten. Yeah. Five years before JK, so so it's the grade plus five. Well, you're in, you're five years old when you're in senior kindergarten, mm. and you're six in grade one. Mm. So it's whatever grade you are plus five. Yeah, mm. yeah. Okay. So there's there's a lot of rules that actually kind of like all get spit out all at once. So first of all, the rule is three offenses, and then you get released. So they have a three strikes policy. Oh boy. In which the third strike, you're done. Um, so they don't do well with recidivist defenders. Recidivist defenders. Yeah. So wow. people that keep coming back. If I the named, system. if I named a uh, podcast that would, this would be this called would be the one, the recidivist defenders. Holy fuck, uh. that's amazing. <laughs> Marvel, you can have that. No recidivist offenders. <laughs> no, no, the <laughs> defenders now. <laughs> this is the thing. So the ceremony of twelve is coming up. For Jonas, but the ceremony of advancement is where every single kid gets advanced. It's mm. also where new couples are given their children. Oh. So every year, 50 children, if none of them are released, 50 children are given out to families. Mm. Um, so Jonas's dad is not supposed to, but he actually looks up the name of the child that he's going to be bringing home, the troubled child, because they're supposed to only be referred to by their numbers until the day they're given to their family. And on that day, they're given their name. Okay. But he already knows this kid's name. The kid's name is Gabriel. Gabe, they call him. Mm. Um, but the kid the kid calls himself gay because he can't. I was just going to say, we call him Gay Boy for short. Yeah, exactly. He can't pronounce the whole thing. So he's like, gay, gay. That's his name. <laughs> um, so you get, there's a bunch of landmarks, but at nine you get your bicycle. So everyone has a bicycle. There are Shit, no- dude, this world's like Pokemon. Kind of, actually. There's no other modes of transportation, just bicycle. Oh, dude, they, it's your flyer. My flyer? It's your first mount. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So you actually, you get a bicycle with training wheels at nine, and then I guess eventually those come off. Um, and then when you have a kid, you get a seat for the back of your bike that the kid goes on and everyone has their own name plates on their bikes and everything and their nameplate even says what their job does mm. like it's a really well organized society it's very clean it's very neat uh, but it's 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 not good have you heard that in in japan they keep things extremely clean we're talking like underneath things yeah isn't it because they have so many people that a lot of the jobs that they have wouldn't necessarily be viable here like, you, there, you can pay a guy to sweep a street, whereas here, there just aren't enough people. It, They're too expensive. It could be that, but it's a, it's a theory that, they've been, that they, they believe in that people are significantly less likely to dirty a very clean space. But no one has a problem throwing a bottle into a landfill. That's a good point. A dirty space, you're more likely to make dirty. Yeah. That's a good point. Like, and if like, I'm looking for a place to litter, I'm going to look for other garbage yeah. to put it with. Like, clean, like a, a clean, well-kept um, uh, grass, like a lawn, makes you, like, it, it kind of makes you not want to step on it. But if it's already fucked up and there's, like, p blotchy patches and, like, dead grass, it's you like, don't whatever, care. I don't give a shit about that. Yeah. I also imagine that the fact that they don't get like really aggressive winners mm. because it's such a dense metropolitan area that you know they don't have uh... does it actually keep like it i was gonna ask do, yeah. do do cities actually make spaces warmer uh in the summer yes because all of the concrete reflects oh, the yeah. heat straight back into the air whereas plants would have absorbed a bunch of the heat as energy right um but also in the winter they prevent a lot of um air movement yeah so if you know here in in our city it's it's we have some high-rise buildings but it's only a couple of four or five story buildings mm -hmm. so the wind just comes along brings its snow and just shits on us 
Whereas in Toronto, when you have 10 40 story buildings all mm-hmm. clustered in an area, that like the city streets get slushy, but they don't really get snow the same way yeah. we do. It's very different. Dude, super tall buildings have like their own weather systems around them. Yeah. Like the 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 wind picks up and when it hits it at the base, it goes straight up and creates an upward draft. And people have Whoa. actually seen upward rain. Whoa. And apparently it's like a theory as to why not like like not as many things fall on people that you'd expect because it actually goes like up. Oh, because, the, yeah, the draft actually throws yeah. it up. Although walking around in downtown Toronto, there's a lot of signs that say warning falling ice. Mm. And you look up and you see 50 stories to the roof. And yeah. you start to think, if ice fell that far, yeah. there's nothing you can do. No. You're done for. And yet, I don't think I've ever heard of that happening. Guaranteed it's happened. I know. It's law ha- of large numbers. Maybe it just happens so often it's not news anymore. I wouldn't doubt it. Mm. Or maybe it happens less now. Maybe back in the day, a thousand people a year died, and now it's like seven. But it's still a lot of people if you're one of those seven yeah. or their family. Uh, so the people who make up the power structure in the community are committee members who are part of like various committees, elders who are exactly what they sound like, and then one of the elders is known as the receiver. Mm. Uh, so the receiver, you don't really learn much about yet, but the receiver is uh, a position of great honor. So it's more of a ceremonial position in yeah. a way. Um, so Jonas's father is, is not being very helpful because Jonas tells him he's, he's like worried about his job and Jonas's father says, oh, for me, it was easy. I already knew what I was going to do. They already knew what I was going to do because he wanted to be a nurturer all along. Mm. So for him, it was one of those no brainer things. Um, and then his mom's the same way. She's like, yeah, no, they pretty much, they, they knew what I was going to be. So Jonas has no support. No one who's like, yeah, I remember it being scary. No one says anything like that. Like, they're so not helpful. You know, they have all these emotion shares, but there's no actual emotion involved in the emotion shares, which just, it's the same as 1984 where everything looks fine, but in your bones, you can just feel that it's wrong. You just know it's wrong. Yeah. And the mom is actually played really well in the story, or sorry, in the movie. Uh, she's played by Katie Holmes. Really? Um, and it, this is not intended huh. to be a slam at Katie Holmes, but she does a really good job playing that super cold, disconnected person. Oh, yeah. And that's what the mom's like. She does a lot of, like, agreement and a lot of nodding. And well, that a lot consistency, of consistency, you think that the actor is not doing anything, but it, you see them in something else. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, Jared Kiso is from Letterkenny. Okay, yeah. And he does the character Wayne fucking beautifully it is so consistent that character has like almost no emotion everything he says is like straight to the point he's real no nonsense character that's why it's funny but then you go and see him in in um 19 2 is a police show he's in where he's a regular dude and so he's got emotions that you know fly off sometimes and you're like oh he's an actor he's like really refined Wayne. That's why Wayne is so consistent, but it feels like he doesn't isn't doing anything. Like, he's just like, ah, whatever. Mm-hmm. I'll just kind of, you know, like, I just won't act, and it'll come off as, like, dry humor, but no, no, no. There's acting involved. The first season of, of, of Letterkenny versus the second, you can really see how much he refined that character. He is so much funnier in the second, because in the first, he sounds like he's pissed. Like just like uninterested. He's angry, yeah. The second one, he's this real, he's this real uh, stereotype, a real. Uh... Yeah, it's important to have the right actor, and uh, Alexander Skarsgård plays the father actually in the, the Giver really? movie. Really? Yeah, yeah. And that's and he played Eric. Eric from True Blood. Because there's another, there's another Skarsgård, right? Is a brother, younger brother. Yeah, I don't know what he's in though. He's I saw him in Hemlock Grove. Oh, okay, but he's also that. in. But uh... no, that's Eric. Bill Skarsgård is also in, um, what's, oh, is that cop movie? It's a buddy cop movie. But that's Eric's. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. So who's Bill Skarsgård? You never explained that. No, what he's... no True Blood. Oh, or, sorry, Hemlock. Just Hemlock Girl, Hemlock. that's it. Yeah. Okay. So he does a really good job as the father, because the father is supposed to be this sort of like lovable bear type character, mm. and he does a really good job. He has those kind eyes. I don't know. Alexander Skarsgård has really eyes, kind eyes. Well, same thing with um, but with uh, out with Bill. Wait, I'm fucking things up now. Yeah, you're fucking everything up. Alexander Skarsgård is the older brother to Bill Skarsgård. Yes. Yes. Okay. Alexander Skarsgård is in that buddy cop movie 
and True Blood, Bill Skarsgård is in Hemlock Grove. And that's it. All right, thank you. Okay, good. Now, he's in more things. He's an actor. But that's all we know. He's an actor. So I realize that people must forget their age after 30, and the parents even comment on that, or after 30, after 12. Because once oh. you hit 12, you get your job. And then there's no more advancement ceremony. There's no more... Yeah, that makes sense. So all of a sudden, uh, apparently there's this place called the Hall of Open Records. There's two halls. There's the Hall of Open Records and the Hall of Closed Records. <laughs> so the Hall of Open Records, you can find everything, like your age and, and all those things. But people just don't care. Why yeah. would you need to know how old you are? Age is just a number, dude. Mm-hmm. It is, actually. It is. I don't give a shit about it. Um, and that's when people start to separate, too. Because you were originally grouped into your year. I should say. What? Of course, there are important numbers. Like, when you can drink and when you can drive, I yeah. can say, those are important numbers. <laughs> but beyond beyond those, like, important ones, like, ages to vote and shit like that... Well, numbers beyond 25 are irrelevant. Then I don't, just, I don't give a shit. Except like, for 55, because then you're... Well, I work in a place where, where it doesn't give... It doesn't fucking matter. I've seen some of the most immature 50-year-olds and some of the most mature 15-year-olds. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. I'm just like, I don't fucking care anymore. Exactly. And that's the point where people start to split up because now it's not, hey, we're all 11s, let's all be friends. Mm -hmm. Now I'm an engineer, you're a maintenance guy, you're a teacher. So everyone starts to split off into different groups and they start to grow apart from each other. And it's really cool, I find, the things that they start to bring in. Like they have a really rigid system for how kids grow up. So when a kid starts to walk, that means they're ready for the discipline wand. So they start getting disciplined as soon as they can walk. And then they're given a comfort object, which, so Lily's comfort object is a stuffed elephant, but they think it's a hippo. They call it a hippo because they're just so unfamiliar with, right. they don't with know animals. Is. You know what? I might actually be messing that up. They did that in the movie. I don't remember if that happened in the mm. book. But also, they never show them to you in the book. Like, you don't physically get to see them, so it's hard right. to know if they're doing it right. But they, their comfort objects are taken away when they're eight years old. And that's like part of the process of them hmm. growing up. But another thing they do that I think is really cool, I forget how old it is. I think it's when they're six. They get, um, yeah, when they're four, they get a jacket that only buttons up in the back, which means that they need other kids to help them get their jacket on and off. Huh. So it teaches them to learn and like develop with other kids. And then when they're six, they get a front facing jacket so they can do their own up and they learn independence. Ooh, what? And then I think when they're seven, they get pockets. At a certain point, they start to get pockets so they can hold their See, own stuff, too. The only way you could ever teach kids that way is to take full control. Which is what they did. Because you imagine that nowadays? Like, schools are now only allowing kids to have... Uh, um, Rear-facing jackets? Yeah. It's, well, like, it's like, man, you can't fucking tell me what... You fucking do your job and teach the fucking kids about the... the, the but it's also dangerous in a way because let's say your jacket gets snagged on something mm. and you need to take your jacket off, but you can't physically reach it. Um, this is a society with nerfed corners. They right. live in a perfect place where there is no crime. There is no, there's no weather. Mm. There is no change in temperature. There is nothing. Their community is essentially indoors, but it's not. That's how controlled their environment is. Hmm. They don't go they into elude as no. to where this is because there are some places in the world that have really consistent weather, right? But it's engineered because the giver goes on. Oh, fuck, you don't know who the giver is yet. But anyway, <laughs> someone <laughs> explains later on, wink, wink, that at some point this whole community, years and not not even years, generations ago decided that they were done with hills because hills made it hard to transport goods. They were done with weather because cold weather made it hard to grow crops. They were done with different colored skin and different colored eyes and different colored hair because it made people separate into groups. So they went to what they call sameness. And with sameness, weather went away. They leveled everything. So there's no, there's no, there's a stream but other than a stream, there is no uncontrolled elements in their environment. Huh. Every oh, I'm sure single that's controlled thing. Controlled too. Exactly. The river is probably like a steel bottom. It's probably not even an actual. Well, they probably river. know exactly how fast it's moving. Like they probably intend that. I honestly bet they put water in it. Like I don't think it's a natural river. Mm. I bet everything has just been turned into this homogenous mass. Or it could just be like liquidized 
people that were released. <laughs> it could be. Who knows? Everything flows through the river. Oh, 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 including all of the shit. Oh, hey, a toenail. <laughs> gross. <laughs> Just gross. <laughs> Just in case people weren't, weren't paying attention. So one thing that is... One thing that's actually really bad about the movie is mm. that in the movie, I guess because it was too hard to find actors with the right colored eyes, their indicator of like um, the special characters was that they had a birthmark. But in this story, you this, can hmm? you can do um, CGI eye colored. What you can do that? You could also do um, uh, what's it called? Like like lenses. Like, but the one guy had brown eyes, and they would have needed to be blue. So you that's can hard, totally isn't do it? that, man. It's not that like, like with with CGI. I'm sure, yeah, telling you this as someone who's just been doing some uh, like some like serious fucking editing, um, it just takes time. Yeah, like, like it's not. It's, it's a matter of desire to do it. Yeah, but also the thing is like they would have had to do it for the entire movie, right? Because the yeah. main. But anyways, so the there's only five people in this whole story with pale eyes. Oh, so there's Jonas. There is a, a female five that they don't really ever talk about, that she, she exists. Um, and then Gabe, who is the baby, also has um, those eyes. Is that only three that I listed? I wasn't paying attention. Okay, but either way, there's a certain <laughs> amount of them, and, and Gabe and Jonas are, are two of them. There's only so much you can expect from me here. So it's hard to picture a lot of this because right now their world is in black and white. Yeah, as in like they see in black and white. Whoa. Yeah, so they're not able to distinguish colors, only tones. So. Oh. That's why they notice pale is eyes. Is the movie black and white? Yeah. Well, the cool thing about the movie is that it starts black and white, and then as Jonas learns to see in color, the movie starts to become colored. Does it slowly change? Yeah. So Jonas first starts to see red, and the movie has the red turned on. Oh, so you can see people's faces cool. sort of normally, but everything else is washed out except for like apples and, and red things. And then slowly wow. with time, the rest of the colors get added. So uh, the movie is really cool and it is really good. But where it starts to fall apart is that, so when they go into the selection ceremony, Asher gets selected to be the recreation director because he's such a fun, loving guy and mm -hmm. he's a trickster. Always walking around calling people cunts. Exactly. <laughs> And, and <laughs> <laughs> honestly, totally forgot about Asher from Spartacus <laughs> until you said that. I wasn't even drawing that connection. That's why I said, believe I'm it like, or not. Like, you can't just walk by Asher. You can't look. <laughs> Somehow just wasn't connecting it. So he becomes a recreation director and Fiona, the, the female friend, becomes a uh, caretaker for the old. Mm. But in the movie, instead of being an, a recreation director, Asher is a jet pilot. So that's a bit of a change. That's a bit different. And Fiona, instead of being caretaker of the old, is a nurturer of the young. So I don't know why they chose to do those. I think sometimes it actually comes down to real life stuff. Changes in in movies, like you know, you're you're familiar with how Lost changed around. Yeah, a couple two, actors. Two characters got killed because they the the actors were um, involved in drunk driving. Yeah, and then I just learned this morning Star Wars. Um, Han Solo was never supposed to be carbonated. It was because Harrison Ford uh, hadn't signed for the third movie yet, so they just wrote something in that made it so that he could come back or not come back. Oh, what? Yeah, he was supposed to escape Cloud City. That's crazy. So the whole scene changed. That's really cool, actually. Yeah. But I think the reason they did it is that later on there's this like drawn out scene where Asher chases Jonas down with a jet and like lets him go, and then there's this scene where like. Um, they're in the nurturing center and Fiona helps him steal something. But those scenes weren't in the book either. So they put in scenes that weren't in the book. And because of those scenes, they had to change those people's professions. Well, there's the fucking example. If it doesn't work, don't fucking do it. You changed something. Yeah. And then had to <laughs> then like patch up the change you did. What's even funnier, though, is that in the story... They're all 12 when they get their job assignments, right? right? So Asher becomes a jet pilot at 12, or this when his training begins. And then the story takes place within the span of about a year, maybe slightly longer. But in the movie, Asher is flying a jet, remotely piloted, <laughs> but he's flying a jet, which means he's 13 
or 14 at the most. <laughs> Sorry. How, so they they didn't know what a jet was. No, they just jets had never flown over their own community, so they didn't know if that meant they were under attack, or oh, if but that they meant knew there was an. Were. Oh yeah, they, and they, they have knew. jets. Yeah, yeah. I don't they know what the jets are for. How do they have jets, but also don't know? Are also terrified of jets. Well, I think the difference is that, you know, when you hear a helicopter flying over you, it's kind of like, why is there suddenly a helicopter flying over mm-hmm. me? Like this doesn't happen any other day. Imagine you had never, ever, ever had anything fly over your head. No jets, no helicopters, no planes, nothing. And then one day, a low-flying jet just goes blasting over your community. Could be from another community. Maybe they decided they wanted to... I don't know. Hmm. But also, this community doesn't even have words for violence in a lot of situations. Like, they don't even necessarily understand how violence would happen. Hmm. But it's the fear of the unknown, right? Right. It's the same way someone will be like, Oh my God, like, I don't want to... I don't want to go to work today. Why not? Because something might happen. It's like, yeah. What? Like, I don't know. Something. I had that... Every day of my life, school and work. Exactly. So that that's honestly what they have. They're just like, huh, what the fuck is that? Get inside the house. You're yelling at us. <laughs> Jerry, get down. So they they also live in a society where it's rude to draw attention to things. And S- anything. So oh, the fact okay. that Jonas has pale eyes, no one would ever mention that because it's a difference. You're oh. never ever supposed to point out people's differences and you have to apologize to them if you do. Oh no. Yeah, so it's a very rigid society. I thought you were going to say it was against the rules to draw people. Well, they don't have mirrors, so they don't see themselves. But I, I don't honestly don't think they would draw each other. Like, they would have... They all look the same, right, I for the most part. I wanted to draw her. I wanted to draw you. So Lily talks about wanting to be a birth mother. And this is where you get a perspective for how the society works. So the way the birth mother system is set up, if you are selected as a birth mother... You get three years where you are pampered and taken care of while you lay three, <laughs> while you <laughs> give birth to three children. I was going to say lay three that's, kids. That's, a, that's an example of how you're viewing their society. Yeah, like... seriously. Because it's all artificial. It's not mm-hmm. like it's not like they bring in birth fathers. Like right? she just takes a squat and just... Exactly. So, One kid, two kid, three kids. She just like like slowly crab walks across the floor. But the thing is, they want that three years to last as long as possible mm. because at the end of those three years, they become a laborer. So what? that's the deal. You get three years to give three children and you get taken care of and then you become a laborer for the rest of your life. Why would you take that? It's not. It's it's selected for you. You're given your job. Oh. Yeah. But the alternative is they just make you a laborer. Right? right? That's the alternative. If you know, for, if you were a male instead of a female, they would be like, okay, laborer. But because you're a laborer who could be a birth mother, that's mm. what you get. So, and Lily said she wanted to be one, and her mom was basically like, bitch, you don't know what you're talking about. You're eight, so <laughs> shut up. <laughs> Pretty much. So, it would be a much better book if, they re- re- if everything was like that. Yeah, I should totally, I should rewrite it. I want to watch her. Bitch, you don't know what you're talking about. So here's a couple of examples of, so they're, they have speakers the similar way to the telescreens in 1984, mm. where they can see what's happening and they can make announcements to the whole community mm. at once. So here's an example of, uh, of something a speaker would say. Attention, this is a reminder to females under nine that hair ri- hair ribbons are to be worn neatly tied at all times. So young girls under nine have to wear hair ribbons, no matter what, and they have to be well tied. Hmm. It's kind of like a dress code. And then there was this other one. Attention, this is a reminder to male <coughs> 11s that objects are not to be removed mm. from the recreation area and that snacks are to be eaten, not hoarded. And notice how specific that is. This is a message to male 11s. Not even 11s. This is a message to a very yeah. small subset. <clears throat> and that was actually aimed straight at Jonas. Because Jonas really? and Asher were just fucking around. They were just throwing an apple back and forth <clears throat> in the rec room. And then Jonas started to see something. Like it changed midair. And you later on go to find out that this is him seeing red for the first time. Oh. He starts to see glimpses of red as the apple is being thrown through the air. And he doesn't understand why, so he keeps the apple thinking it's the apple that has oh. changed. And so that message was was aimed, like, directly at him. It's so petty. Male 11s shall not, you know. And somebody. And his parents knew, too. His parents, mm. like, you know, they were like. They ratted him out. Kind of, well, they kind of just looked at him, and he knew. It's one of those things, you know, like, um, like some people with their parents, it's like, 
My mama didn't have to hit us. My mama just had to look at us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm not going to do it. I, I'm good. I'm good. So when when you become an eight, which is what Lily is about to become, you start your volunteer hours, mm. which is actually the coolest part about their society. So from eight to 12, you volunteer wherever you want during like a you know you have peri- like a, a period of time that you have to spend volunteering and then the elders watch you spending all that time and through that decide where you'll fit best oh so it's actually a really cool system <clears throat> that funnels people towards things that they're going to want to do the difference is it doesn't allow for self starters you kind of have to fall into the specific things that the community needs from you yeah right um what do I, what do I got here What do I got here? So this is just an example of how you're really not supposed to talk about anything. You're not supposed to flatter people because it's awkward. So Benjamin is this super smart kid. And this is a quote from the book. They had never talked much about the boy's accomplishments because such a conversation would have been awkward for Benjamin. There was never any comfortable way to mention or discuss one's successes without breaking the rule against bragging, even if one didn't want to. It was a minor rule, rather like rudeness, punishable only by gentle chastisement. But still, better to steer clear of an occasion governed by a rule which would be so easy to break. So that's how finicky this society is with rules, that they would rather not talk about something on the off chance that they might break a rule of rudeness. Dude, that's how I treat this show, like the whole channel. But sometimes I just don't bring something up because I'm like, I'm not even sure if I can say that without it becoming a controversial topic. That's that's so true. It's really hard to think of things that are that you don't have to skirt at all. I've already thought of like three things I've said so far, and then I'm like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> like, man, if you have a problem with that, like, just fucking go to a forum. Don't yeah. talk about it on my comment section. So Jonas is spending some time uh, volunteering at the House of the Old with his friends. The um, House of the Old. And it's interesting because they, so they're never nude except for young children and old people. So the volunteers just give the old people sponge baths. Like that's the scene yeah, that that's, they show. That's coming. Yeah, that's coming back to me now. And it's, so actually they even talk about how you need a certain amount of volunteer hours. Mm. And if you don't get enough, you cannot get assigned a job as a 12. Mm. So in the ceremony, they'll like single you out and say like, you don't have enough hours. And some that happened to some kid, and he was essentially like a pariah after mm-hmm. that because he had to do like some sort of subsequent thing. Basically, in this society, if you're not super generic, you super stand out. Oh. And like people don't like that. Yeah, I know. So, yeah, it's it's weird watching, like watching, reading the scene where they're bathing the old people. It is a little strange, but <laughs> it, it, it's really all about shame. You know, if you don't associate shame with it, it's not shameful. And in their society, they don't. So it's just, it's not a big deal. Yeah, on that topic, I'm kind of curious. How, how do like really overweight people dry themselves off? Like on the lower section, you know, like the legs. Because Maybe. when Maybe I dry sitting. my legs, I'm like a folding chair. Like, <laughs> like my upper body is like down at my legs. And I'm like, man, how would you do this? Because I hurt my back like a two, couple weeks ago. And like trying to like dry certain spots, I was like, oh. <clears throat> yeah. That's not working. That's bad, not bad directions today. on the back. Uh, potentially bring the leg up, you know, like up on the edge of the tub. Oh, boy. Because that's what I used to do, like, when I was young. I used to throw the... Actually, I still do. Because it's easier. Or, like... Throw the leg like up a, on the tub. A towel on the stick or something. I wash myself <laughs> with a rag on a stick. Oh. Simpsons comedy oh. goal. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> so, so, Jonas is talking to this old woman named Larissa who is actually a very nice lady. And so she talks about uh, a release that just happened, a guy named Eduardo who was really loved. Mm. And then Roberto, sorry, who was really loved. And then she says that not all releases are fun. And then she talks about this one woman named Edna, and she's like, between you and me, Edna was not very smart. So it seems like the old people are the ones who've given up on the whole rudeness thing. Oh. They're just like, ah, we're old, we're gonna be released. Let's just, huh? let's just talk some shit. So Roberto had a great life and was happy when he was released because in a lot of ways, if your society treats it as this wonderful thing and you have a great life between your birth and your release, Mm -hmm. there's really nothing to be sad about per se. 
Um, it would be different if they knew what was actually happening. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is weird how no one questions what release means. Right. And that's why I think the movie was kind of cool because in the movie it was more authoritarian. There was more physical threat of violence for those who spoke out mm-hmm. or for those who questioned. Whereas in this, it seems like everyone just goes along with it. It's almost like the brainwashing is so strong that no one even questions. That's what I found interesting about uh, Hunger Games is that they didn't... I mean, they always had, like... They were really good at crafting ideas for the the rich places to make, convince them that shit wasn't happening, but they basically they didn't even beat around the bush with like twelve. Like they just showed up and just fucking knocked people over. They're like, hey, if you do this, we'll fucking kill you. Yeah. There was like no, like they had like a like a system of like where to lie and where not to lie because they just don't give a shit. Well, and also in the richer districts, they have incentive to participate in the Hunger Games because then they have champions. Those champions bring money back to the district because Mm. they become wealthy when they win. Whereas the lower districts are controlled by the higher districts. So all you have to do is keep the rich ones happy. The same Mm -hmm. way kings didn't appeal to peasants, they appealed to nobles. I wonder... I wonder if the champions or the or the, the what what are they ever they're called were are chosen at random or if they're in the rich districts. I never even considered that. I wonder if like in two, do they just open it to like the two people who are like physically strong? Because like one of the guy who plays Thad is 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 in the is in the the one movie. Is he? Oh, yeah. that is him. And yeah, he's just a fucking monster. And then you see like some of the districts have like an eleven year old kid. I wonder if there's actually, like, people who train to be oh, in they, the Hunger Games. they speak about that, yeah. Do they? Yeah, the, so the people from Districts 1 and 2 were all trained specifically for that and mm. knew that they were going to volunteer that year. Like, that was their year. So when the year came up, they were like, I volunteer immediately. But doesn't he, doesn't one of, like, the, the ones that's, like, su- like, physically superior have some sort of, like, breakdown where they, like, they're aware of how fucked up this is? You're talking about the black one? No, no, because he was he was from like District Eight or something, something way down there. There was one that like I'm pretty sure it was the guy who plays Thad. I swear it was that guy. No, because he was the very very last one. He stuck was it he? out as a as a douchebag right until the end, Did he? to the bitter end. Yeah. Fuck, I gotta watch yeah, because he gets uh, spoiler alert. He gets like shot in the neck and then falls into zombie dogs and ripped apart. So no, that's a different guy. Is it? Yeah. Oh, Thad's in the second yeah. one. Yeah. Are you sure that's dude, Thad though? In the book. That dude that falls into the into the dogs in yeah. the book, he's wearing armor that's so thick that they can't kill him, so they just rip him apart for hours, and the two oh. have to just sit there listening to it. Oh, so you can see why that didn't end up in the movie. Oh my god! Actually, you know this book has a lot of that too, where there's things that are they're done much more viciously in mm. the book, and just in the movie that like, people wouldn't have had the stomach for it. I guess. I get it. I get that not everyone can create content like us where they're doing it on the side as a part-time thing and have a real job. Like, if you're given, uh, like, $6 million to make a movie, you have to make sure that people watch it or you might not make another movie. But at the same time, maybe if it was, like, really good and really consistent with the book, it actually might pull in, like, a great niche market. I get that the niche market isn't what they're after, but... Yeah, they're after the money and, and that, yeah, that is honestly the problem. Uh, but here's your favorite part. Uh, so <laughs> here it is. Um, so Jonas has a dream about Fiona. Mm. And in it, he's he's standing with Fiona and they're standing next to the bathtub. And he's trying to convince her to get undressed and get in the bathtub so that he can wash her. Mm. That's his dream. Get in there. <laughs> get in, take, your <laughs> take your clothes off. Get in the tub. <laughs> so... So he wakes from the dream, and apparently they do dream sharing in the morning. So it's feeling share at night, dream share in the morning. And I just feel like if any modern person was put in this society, they would be released within a week. Oh, less maybe than within that. a day. First yeah. day, because they would be oh, it would just it would drive you up a, a wall. These people are bonkers. Anyway, bonkers. so so they call. <laughs> I was gonna say bananas, but I don't know. Bonkers sounds more they fun. They know what that is. They might not actually. <laughs> they know what an apple is, so I hope. But maybe that's no, no, wait, no. That that one would give would give feelings because it's similar to a penis. <laughs> and honestly, I think bananas are harder to grow. Like apples are, are pretty easy to. Well, we grow apples here. We do not grow bananas here, as far as no, I know. That's true. Um, but anyways, uh, they're talking about the dream, and so 
they kind of just they kind of just like get Lily out of the room. The dad's like, "All right, Lily, let's go," and just like drags her off. Mm-hmm. And then the mom says, "Okay, so this is what we call the wanting." And the, or no, sorry, that's what Jonas keeps saying. He's like the thing he keeps remembering from the dream is how much he wanted something. Oh. The wanting. And then so she says that this is what they call the stirrings. And then <laughs> and what they do is they take a pill. As soon as the stirrings start, they take a pill and it makes the stirrings go away. Mm. And they take that pill every day for the rest of their life until they enter the house of the old. And that's probably why the old people yeah. are all cheeky as fuck. Because it's like it's kind of like, you know, it's like a common meme in our society that you have a, a certain amount of time, money, and energy. And you're always short on one depending on what point you're at. When you're a kid, you have time and energy, but no money. When you're an adult, you have money and energy, but no time. And then when you become an old person, you have money and time, but But no no energy. energy. (laughs) Well, that's like a project, right? You can only choose two of the three, fast, quick, or well done. Yeah. Or sorry, fast, cheap, or well done. That's also what mechanics will tell you. Yeah. I can can do it right. I can do it cheap. Or I can do it quickly. Yeah. And... Honestly, that's what, that's anything. Anything you do, really, you do have those options. And an important thing to note is that a guy that I know who used to own his, who he used to own a restaurant. He says better late than late and lousy. If you give somebody a, a garbage product after they had to wait too long, they'll be even more pissed. Yeah, they will not come back. But if they waited for something great, then that wait is no longer even in. They don't even remember that because mm-hmm. it's a great product, right? Yeah, and. Always better late and lousy than, or sorry, always better <laughs> late and good than on time and lousy. Oh, absolutely. In fact, the same guy was telling me about a study done that was polling people on on like what makes them satisfied as a customer. And it's always, they want, they, they don't give a shit about, you know, like he gave me something free or he gave me my money back or all this shit. They want what they what they asked for, what they ordered. What they came for, Give yeah. me what I asked for. I don't care that you're going to give me another one for free and I'm going to have two of what I asked for. I want it right the first time. And people will yeah. wait, as angry as they believe they are about the wait time, th- as long as they get what they wanted the first time, it nothing okay. can make up for it. Refunds, remakes, all that shit is, is not going to make up for not getting what they wanted. That's it. Yeah, That's all people want. It's tough sometimes when we write reports, it can't be late. There's no late option and there's no um, not good option Mm. because my company specializes in excellence. Right. So the the other option is always the one that gets pushed the most. It's like, okay, it's going to be really expensive because it could be a lot of overtime. That's that's why I've been, that's that's what's happening with the show I'm working on. It's it's not going to be late because there's no promises. I'm not going to make any promises. Don't set a Because it has to come out when it's ready. And that's, yeah. you know, like my, my, the, the, the guys that I play Siege with are also into clutchers. And I said that the episode would probably be out one night and then the one guy expected mm. it. And he's like, I was really disappointed when I didn't see it. And I'm like, you're right. You're I absolutely said right. That. I shouldn't have said it because the reason why it didn't come out is because it wasn't the way it needed to be. It wasn't done. And once it's out, that's it. It's out. It's, 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 that's its final form. And you're not going to, yeah, we don't change it. It's, it it's not going to, yeah. yeah. No one does. Once you I, post the YouTube yeah. videos, I haven't, even, I haven't even changed that Shovel Knight episode. It's too late now, man. <laughs> No, I it's have gone to change it, man. Past. That's fucked up. So the Ceremony of Twelve finally occurs. Mm-hmm. So the Ceremony of Twelve is a huge two-day-long event. And I'm not even sure if they get weekends in this community because this is a two-day holiday that they get every year. And it sounds like people are really jacked up about it. Mm-hmm. So everyone gets those two days off. Um, and so the new children are given out first to the new families. Um, Gabe is not able to be given a new family because he's not developed enough. So mm-hmm. Gabe is now going to stay with Jonas's family for a full additional year to see if that like helps him become ready for the next hmm. generation. But also remember that if Gabe were to become ready, that would mean he's a full year older than all the other kids in his you know, plot year. Yeah. So he would be a one, but he'd actually be two years old. No, I meant this is adding to the plot. Yes. The the plot thickens like a good stew. With two C's? What? Thick plot? (laughs) Yeah. Major thick plot. Uh, So two of the children were named Caleb and Roberto. 
Roberto being the old man who was just released, and Caleb is the name of a child who drowned in the river a few years earlier. Oh. So names are only able to be reused once they've been used before. Oh, Jonas shit. has no last name, neither does his parents or his sister or any of his friends. Oh, wow. They're like Yeah, they're so like there's only stars. one Jonas. Yeah. This is Cher. <laughs> this is Gambino. Single names. Uh, and then, oh, so the first pockets are at eight. So Lily gets her first pockets. <laughs> Exciting. <laughs> Chapter seven. Pockets. But I think, yeah, and she would probably still have to wear her hair ribbons. So she's her next year would be her biggest year because she gets her bicycle at nine. Mm. Um, so. What do we do? Okay. <laughs> so this is, yeah, so this is. I hope that the page turning was audible on that because it really made the comedy of that scene. Yeah. Uh, so there is, there's some kids that just aren't as good and you know how i said anything Mm non-generic just makes you stand out so there's this kid named fritz and so this is what jonas was thinking he knew his parents cringed a little as he did when fritz who lived in the dwelling next door to theirs received his bicycle and almost immediately bumped it into the podium fritz was a very awkward child who had been summoned for chastisement again and again his transgressions were small ones, always shoes on wrong feet, schoolwork misplaced, failure to study adequately, but such errors reflected negatively on his parents' guidance and infringed on the community's sense of order and success. So Fritz's abilities are like, it's this is crumbling our society. Yeah, well, just listen to this section. Infringed on the community's sense of order and success. The kid is clumsy. He's, and yet he infringes. He? Uh, oh, he's nine. He just got his bike. <laughs> and they're like, this this kid is an affront to our community. He needs to be fucking released. It's not that bad. But what is really messed up is that their ceremony of 10 is when they cut their hair for the essentially the first time. So kids grow their hair out pretty much like their whole childhood. And then it gets cut at 10 and they go from a child's haircut to an adult haircut. Oh. But they do it on the stage in front of everyone. Wow. Every kid gets their hair cut With individually. With a giant pair of scissors that cuts the whole thing at once. Like those ones for ribbons? Yeah. Shit. It's huge. Yeah. <laughs> well, they definitely have to get recut after because they're always done like super hasty. And then um, I think this is at lunch. So they have a break or maybe this is the mid, the middle of the two days, and Asher is mentioning that somebody once applied for release. Oh. Like, you can apply for release if you want. Um, and apparently she applied for release and got it the next day. So they were talking about, like, you know, what do you do if you hate your job? <laughs> you right. Apply for release. Right. Um, again, not knowing what that means, mm-hmm. what that, like, really implies. Uh, and then you learn a little about how Um, couples get their kids. So couples have to be approved before they even become a couple. So once Hmm. they've been approved, then they can be a couple. And then I think it's after three years they can then apply for children. Wow. So it's a very rigid system. But that's what builds strong family units in their eyes. Yeah, well, yeah, well, in our society, (laughs) we have some people who accidentally have kids before they've even been in a relationship for an an amount of time. So in some ways, it's a healthy idea. Oh, yeah. But But people talk about the marriage. Not marriage. They talk about a a, a license to have children. And it's like, you can't do that. No, but at the same time, we kind of do that with adoption. You do have to go through a pretty rigid system. It's a lot of money. It takes a lot of time. And, yeah, and that's because you want to make sure that the right people are yeah. getting involved with it. And that's then... really interesting. That's like, it's like, it, it's the, the law is often on the child's side, but the person has the right to be the parent to the child until something has been proven. To be wrong, yeah. Which means that the system is actually set up so that the only way you can be taken away from your shitty parents is by them doing something extreme. Extremely shitty, and then the harm's already done. But emotional trauma is so hard to to, to Prove. L- label that it can have... I mean, if I, who do you know that doesn't have some sort of childhood tick? Something Seriously, from when they yeah. were a kid. Some minor, some major. And but a yeah. lot of it comes down to, like, shit that their parents did. Not like, 
I fell in the lake when I was a kid, and now I don't like water. I'm talking like every time my mom came home, she'd fucking flick me in the eye. And now every time somebody comes home, I got this weird twitch in my eye. It's like fucked up shit like that. Yeah, it's or like, like whenever my dad would crack a beer, he would throw the cap at me. So right. now every time I hear that, it like makes me cringe. Yeah. yeah. It's so true. Kids nowadays get PTSD from their fucking childhood. You say nowadays, but you feel like kids in the 50s probably had it worse. Absolutely. (laughs) But back then, they were told that they were fucking pussies for for having feelings, so they would just put it to the side. Uh. Now it's like, now it's actually being talked about. Now it's actually like, oh, you have childhood trauma. Well, let's discuss this. Well, it's definitely more recognized, yeah. Yeah. Uh, So when... When they're giving out jobs, I don't know if you remember this part, but she thanks every child individually for their childhood. She, the, the chief elder, as she hands out jobs, even says, thank you for your childhood after <laughs> each one. And here's where some of the differences start to emerge between uh, the book and the movie as well. Random, useless differences. So Jonas is number 19 in his group out of 50. And when they're doing the selection ceremony, they go up to 18, and then they skip to 20. And they go right over them. What? Yeah. Anyways, I'll get back to that. But in the in the movie, there's 100 kids. Oh. Because why not just, like, 100 sounds better than 50. And Jonas is, like, 57. Why not just keep the numbers? The numbers were fine. That That's, see, that, that right there is an example where, like, that in no way improves your movie or increases the demographic of people who are going to watch it. No, or makes your plot. Like, it doesn't change anything. In fact, that actually might make people who have who are like a big fan of the book, like get the get up. Just be like, like what? fuck you. Yeah, like why? So, anyways, she skips through Jonas and goes to the next one, and then keeps going all the way to fifty, and then she comes back to Jonas and she says, "You feel like I've made a mistake. You feel like I've missed." somebody but i haven't jonas has been selected for a very specific task jonas will be the new receiver oh so the receiver is that elder i mentioned before who they don't really describe his job yet but his job is to store all of the memories that the rest of the community has forgotten oh boy yeah and it's a huge weight but that's why they need to select a very specific person to be trained as a new receiver yeah so the Jonas and the old man who is the current receiver are two of the people who have pale eyes. So in this, oh. in the book, pale eyes is sort of the indicator of, you know, who could or could not be a receiver. Interesting. Mm-hmm. And which is cool because pale eyes is such an obvious thing. When you look at someone, you would notice instantly that their eyes don't look the same as everyone else's who are all super dark. So he is given, um, he is given a set of um, rules that he needs to follow. Um, But I'll I'll break those down a little bit more. But he's told that there's this selection process to get a receiver. And I thought it was kind of funny how it works. So first of all, once you select a receiver, you can't change your opinion. Once they start training, you can't change that. They have, like, Mm -hmm. they must go through with it. And then they said that um, his training will be totally alone and that he will be in great physical pain when he does it. Whoa. So they're terrifying him in front of the entire community telling him all this. And she says that the receiver needs to be able to see beyond. And you remember the story beyond. about Jonas with the apple, right? Right. No one else can see that. So in a way, that is Jonas seeing beyond the normal experience of the rest of the community. Wow. And she even says that during the receiver selection, if any one of them has a bad dream then that like like that makes it seem like that's not a good receiver candidate they're no longer considered so anything hmm. can set off this process any one of the elders having a bad dream about Jonas would have taken him out of the running <laughs> yeah that's their process <laughs> so all of a sudden when they leave the ceremony everyone's uneasy around Jonas because in a community where everyone is supposed to be generic he was just singled out in a major way right. and told he's going to have one of the highest positions of honor in the community so all of a sudden everyone's really apprehensive around him yeah which makes it's... Jonas uncomfortable I exactly well everyone around him is all of a sudden there's this hesitation in when of they course. do it um, it's, and... like when, it's like when someone you work with suddenly becomes the boss Yes. And you're like, ooh. Yeah, now there's this weird power dynamic. 
And then later on, Jonas starts to ask because he heard that there was an old receiver. And so he says, you know, what what happened to the last receiver? Like, tell me about the last receiver. And so what his parents tell him is that it was a female, the last one, and it was 10 years before the, the story happened. Oh. And they also say that the name of the last receiver, the one who failed, is now no longer in circulation. That oh. name will never recur. And then so this, this is this is foreshadowing. Yes, this is them saying the receiver, because they're given all this knowledge and responsibility, is very is is likely to um, do things that the society is not comfortable with to the point where they will crush that name forever. Uh, you actually come to find out later that it's the opposite. It's um, oh, they're retired. It's out of Jersey. honor. It's out of honor. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. They're having this conversation, and then his mom says this really crazy thing. So his parents look blank. We don't know what happened to her, his father said uncomfortably. We never saw her again. A silence fell over the room. They looked at each other. Finally, his mother, rising from the table, said, You've been greatly honored, Jonas. Greatly honored. And they say that later on in the story they keep saying how this is a great honor because nobody wants to accept the fact that it's a curse right that they've burdened him with well, you're, they're gonna give him all these all this information all these things that he now knows that no one else can know you've now given him all this information and then said don't talk to it don't talk to anybody about it yeah what well, gets even worse because jonas reads his instructions so everyone is given a folder with their instructions mm -hmm. and most of them are these huge booklets filled with information jonas's is one sheet of paper <laughs> it's one word <laughs> it's pretty close when you can like when you consider how different it is yeah um but i'll actually just read the rules to you because when when you're in a society that has rigid rules and then you read rules like these it makes you uneasy, uneasy, which Jonas is already uneasy. He, so, rule one. Go immediately at the end of school hours each day to the annex entrance behind the house of the old and present yourself for attendance. So, as soon as he's done school, he goes there. Rule two. Go immediately to your dwelling at the conclusion of training each day. Rule three. From this moment on, you are accepted from rules governing rudeness. You may ask any question of any citizen and you will receive answers. Whoa. Rule four, do not discuss your training with any members of the community, including parents and elders. Rule five, from this moment on, you are prohibited from dream telling. Rule oh. six, except for injury and in injury and illness unrelated to training, you do not apply for medication. So he can't take medication for whatever happens as Whoa. the receiver. Rule seven, you are not permitted to apply for release. <laughs> even though we know the last one applied and successfully was given release. So that's a new rule. Oh, so the person who applied was the giver. Was the old receiver. Receiver, yeah. sorry. So now the new receiver's rules say you may not apply for release. And then the final rule, you may lie. Oh. Yeah. So this giver, I imagine, is some sort of shadow figure that works in tandem with the receiver. Uh, no, so the joke is the, um, the existing receiver, yeah. the old man, yeah. becomes the giver because he is now giving the memories to the new receiver. Oh. Yeah, so no, the giver is just a, it's just like a t title. It's it's a joke, actually. He says, if I'm the receiver, what does that make you? And he says, I guess that would make me the giver. So does this, I mean, maybe you're probably about to explain it, but is the giver an important element in this story? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's about to go meet the giver. Oh, okay. Yeah, spoilers. All right. All right. <laughs> so Jonas believes at this point that he will never break the rule on rudeness because he's so accustomed to it that it would feel awkward for him to do that. It's, it's like if you had a black friend and he's like, he's like, he's like we really like you. You're allowed to say the N-word now. And you're like, you're like no, nah, not going to do that. I think I'm going to do it. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you like me and that's good enough for me. Yeah, you know what? Yeah. I, I will be your N-word. <laughs> But I will not say it. Uh, so the goal of precision of language is to avoid the unintentional lies, right? Things like, I'm starving. That's a lie. You don't mean it to be a lie. It's not really a lie. It's a lie. It's an exaggeration. A lie when you mean it. And, and, and that's what an unintentional lie kind of is. Because I don't, I, I think lying is entirely about intention. Exactly. So if you put those, I mean, it's an oxymoron. It's like a small, yeah. it's like a big shrimp. Yeah. Right. But. 
And I guess, yeah, some people do consider that a lie when you don't know, but I agree with you. It's more about intention. Well, the most successful way to take on a, a life or an idea that is not true is for you to convince yourself that it's, it, it's real. That's what they tell the wives on the unit when they have to go and like when they have to disappear and become new people. They're like, we're not going to change your first name because you spent your whole life um, responding to it. We're going to change your last name. This is, these are your new jobs. This is who you actually are. So just tell yourself this is who you are. It's not a lie anymore. This now, is your life. It is a lie because they aren't actually the people they claim they are. But they're like, just tell yourself that this is who you are now. Don't even that's the best way to do it. Have two versions of yourself: yeah. the real one and the and just the switch. old one. Just switch. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's so true. And so he also goes over the conundrum: What if everyone's instructions, the last rule, is you may lie? How would you know? People oh, would lie to you about that, right? That was like that guy when we used to play WoW, and he's like, he's like, oh, this, the the one guy that we know has this this uh, uh, this trinket that allows him to to see what the enemy is saying, and I'm like, exactly how can we confirm this information? Because I can't see what he's what they're saying, so I can never. Yeah, I can't know that. You no, know, like immediately I was like, no. Yeah, and then years later we met some dude who knew him, and he's like, "Dude, he didn't have that shit, yeah. man. He was making that shit up." The odds of us figuring that out <laughs> years later. So Jonas finally gets his his new bicycle tag, citizen in training, because that's what all of them say mm. when they turn twelve, citizen in training. Mm. And then he finally goes to meet the old man. He goes to meet the giver. So, in the movie, the giver's home is situated at the edge of this, like, floating city type thing. Like, they're on this, like, floating platform with, like, mist around it. And what? the giver's house is built, like, right on the edge. So much so on the edge, he has this huge plate glass window that looks out off into, like, the abyss. Whoa. But in the book, his house is just behind the house of the old. It's just like a different building next to the old people building. They didn't so, have the like, budget to show that shit. That's what happened. No, it would have cost more to put them on the edge of the fucking cliff. It would have been way cheaper to just be like, oh, you see that building behind the other building? Yeah, that's where the giver is. Oh, you mean in, sorry, in the movie he has the, the grand. Yeah, this grand thing like, oh, we were always afraid to get near the edge. No, that's not how it worked. They went to the giver's house every time they volunteered with the old because they're fucking side by side. But in the book, it's like, oh, we never wanted to venture near the giver's house. It's just so, it's what? just shit they just came up with. They just. Why would you change that? I don't know. They changed things that didn't. It ruins like the, the you, I idea. want you to watch it after we're done this. And then we'll come back and have a podcast <laughs> about how the movie just wasn't as good. It ruins like the theme. Yeah, and instead of... Okay, spoilers. It's just it's so many things I want to talk about. The movie didn't do well. we got to get there first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the attendant unlocks the door to the giver's room, and Jonas is kind of shocked because there are no locked doors anywhere in the community mm. except for in the giver's annex. It's the mm. only place because he needs, like, pure silence. The annex. Is that normally where, where books are kept? Is that mm. what that, that, that term means? I don't really know what an annex is in a, as a physical space. Oh, yeah, no, I've heard that term before. Huh? I can't say that I have. Well, annex it means to like take over a country, to move yeah, into well, a country yeah, militarily. Yeah, I know that because I played Gears of War, but um, <laughs> there's a game mode called Annex. Anyway, no, I've heard that it's like the Hunter's Annex or something like that. Okay, so honestly, it's probably just um, like a place, like a place to like a lounge. Mm. Uh, Because that's what it is. It's a lounge filled with books. And it is. It's like a luxurious room that he lives in. But I started to get to thinking, I wonder whether the giver is a prisoner or not. Because when you think about Jonas being burdened with this, yeah, in a way, he's a prisoner. And that sort of goes to show like how in in the movie, it's actually way more obvious he's a prisoner. Mm. It's like it's um, made more obvious by the authoritarian type thing. Um, but in this, it's it's alluded to, but not really. So his room is just filled with books. And Jonas, being the totally empty drone that he is at 12 years old, uh, he starts to wonder if the books are filled with, like, rules and committees and things because the only books he owns 
are filled with the rules of the community and the way the community or the committees run and like how factories should be built and like mm. it's all really boring like schematics so he assumes that every book in this room must be filled with all that boring crap right even though the i honestly think the best thing about the movie was this physical space they put the giver in because his room looked so appropriate to what i had pictured the giver's room would That's look like awesome. wall to wall floor to ceiling books and then you know a really nice open like hardwood floor area with a nice bed and a nice desk and mm. sort of um something you would imagine someone from the late 1800s who was very wealthy having like mm. that's sort of what his stuff all looks like very rich probably from many generations ago so he enters this room and the giver the giver says something and then Jonah says, oh, I'm sorry. And he says, don't apologize to me anymore. We do not have time for that. Like, just please. <laughs> he, he's just so tired of it because everybody else does it, right? That instant, like, I'm sorry, I accept your apology. Yeah. So he tells him no. Like, like don't call me sir. Yeah, none of that here. And then the giver says, um, the giver says, I want to share, I'm going to share with you memories of the past. And Jonah says, I would love to hear about your life. And he says, no, that's... This is not what I'm talking about at all. And so after a while, he says, okay, um, I'm going, like, so he walks over the wall and he turns off his speaker. And he's the only person oh. in the community who can turn it off. Very much, you remember in 1984 how yeah. O'Brien could turn off his, his yeah, telescreen? Yeah. yeah, so the giver can actually turn it off, whereas basically no one else can. Ooh. So he flicks it off because no one can see the training, right? Because he can't even share it with elders. And then he comes back to Jonas and um, and he's he said it's it's hard for me to explain. It's almost like while I'm thinking about it, it's like when a sled gets to the bottom of the hill and all the snow starts to build up and it slows down into a stop. Right. And Jonas says, "What's a hill?" <laughs> he's never seen a hill, so he has no idea what the giver's saying. So the giver says, "All right, lie down on the bed," and he puts his hands on Jonas's back. And then all of a sudden, Jonas feels coldness. Like he can taste his breath. He can see his breath. He looks around. He's at the top of a hill. What? And he's sitting on a sled. And so he, he like Whoa. feels the crisp air. He can feel it on his skin. And so he grabs the rope and he rides down the hill. And he so he experiences it. And then when he comes out of it, he's talking to the giver. And he says that, that white stuff and the giver says what that white stuff what's it called the memory will give you the word and then Jonas goes snow it was snow so Whoa. he can actually figure out what things are called from the memory what? that the giver gives him how do I not remember this part dude this is this is like one of the craziest parts um, and then and then so he's he's shown him this but he's also given him a bunch of like he told him that what a sled's called, what a hill's called, what a, you know, so he wants to give him something else. So he shows him what sunshine feels like because they don't even have sunshine in their community. Hmm. I don't know if it's because of cloud also, cover. Also, like, everything is just, like, diffused light. Yeah, exactly. Mm. So he feels, like, the warmth of it on his skin, like, for the first time in his whole life, understands what it would be like. And then <laughs> it's kind of funny. He says, he says, okay, I want to experience... Like, you know, you said there would be pain, but, you know, this is all wonderful. And he says, okay, well, let me let me show you some pain. I'm just getting you warmed up. So he gives him a sunburn. He gives him, like, a few, like hours sitting in the sun. Oh. Sunburn. And you know how ruthless oh, a yeah. really bad sunburn could be. And the cool thing is that when he wakes from his dreams, he has remnants of the feeling from the dream. It's not like if he, you know, it's not like the Matrix. You don't die here because you died in, your, right. in the memory. But if in the memory, if your arm broke, you would come out of the memory and your arm would be sore. Mm. So there is this um, this coupling of mind and body that uh, that you can really feel with these two characters. Wow. Um, and so this is actually really far. Like he's been learning a lot along the way. Um, and they don't describe most of the memories that he learns. You just know that they're mostly good things. Like he teaches him about sailing and about... Um, beautiful views and he starts to learn colors and then and then there's this uh, this memory where 
I don't know why the giver was showing him this memory, but he, he sleds down the hill, that same hill, and when he gets to the bottom of it, there's a home there, and he looks through the window of the home, and he sees these people sitting around for Christmas. But it was actually kind of funny, because Jonas goes, it was really weird to see the tree inside the house. Because they, they don't celebrate Christmas. So to them, right. trees are outside, right? Yeah, yeah. So he's like, why was there a tree in their house? And who are the old people sitting in the house? And he says, those were called grandparents. Because they don't have grandparents. When so this this is in fact our society in the future. In the future, yeah. And so he even said they call them parents of parents because they don't even like grandparents is still like a foreign term to him. Because what happens in this society is once your children move out, you go and live with the other childless adults, and then once you get too old, you go to the house of the old. Whoa. So you, there are no grandparents. You don't, he doesn't even know, Jonas doesn't know who his father's father is or his mom's mom or any of that. Whoa. Yeah. So he's been introduced to the first idea of like love and like real family, not family unit. And that scene is actually really important, I find, that, that he shows him what a home is and also the just remember the fact that he sleds down a hill and sees the home because that ends up coming back later in the story mm. a little bit of foreshadowing so jonas finds out that um fiona's been working at the house of the old and apparently they use a discipline wand on the house of the old people too really yeah so they discipline anyone who's old enough to walk holy <laughs> so yeah um and also one day he sees the change in Fiona's hair, that same change that he saw in the apple. Because so Fiona's been a green-haired lady the whole time. Are apples green, bro? Well, I mean, some are, but... Oh! Ha! You know what? I didn't even you think of that. You, you got, got me. You played yourself, Yeah, right? Yeah, I played myself pretty good there. Uh, but no, so the giver tells him that he's seeing red because the, Fiona has red hair mm. and the apple is red. And then he says, did you notice anything about the sled when you were first on it in the memory? Oh, shit. Jonas it was says, brown. Jonas says, I, like, I didn't even look at the sled. And he says, okay, this time look down at it. And when he looks down at it, the sled is vibrant red. Mm. Because in the memory, all colors are there. It's only in real life that he has to actually acquire the colors and like oh. learn to see them. So it's weird because I don't understand if the had a genocide or what, but everyone has the same skin tone, eye color, hair color. So at some point, those who didn't fit that had to have left the society or at least not been in it, right? So I don't know what exactly that means. I don't know if that means that they killed off all the people that weren't perfect. Yeah. Or if they just, through millions of years of selection and breeding, bred it out. I don't know. But they've now gone to sameness in all things. And that's why this community is so robotic. That's, you, do you think it could be those pills? Because everyone making, after generations, if you're taking that pill that makes your, your eyes go um, colorblind, it then would eventually build up. Your, your kids would get that eventually. Well, and also if you take a, if both parents take a certain amount of a drug, the kid will have twice as much of that drug. Mm. Or no, that's... I'm doing that backwards. Half as much? No. Um, <laughs> what I was thinking was um, if there's two crickets that have a certain amount of poison in them and then a bird eats both those crickets, that bird has twice as much poison. Mm -hmm. It's... <laughs> I was just, you know, I was doing the process backwards. I don't because know. Because in this story, grandparents eat the children and then have more kids. But it does make sense that if both the parents were taking something regularly, that it would have more of an effect on the kid. Yeah. Especially if the mom took them while she was pregnant. Yeah, um, like which, crack babies. They might not though, because they're birth mothers. Is that me? Yeah, I gotta mute that shit. It scared me. <laughs> they're they're birth mothers, right? So they're probably regulating what they eat and what you know all the yeah. things that they're taking in. Because I'm sure that they're smart. They're smart people. It's just they're weird people. What um, like with a with a with a kid born with crack in their system, are they weaker or stronger? A weaker, weaker. Yeah, the, right. It, That's what the Cat Williams bit is that they had to give their kids steroids. To like compensate, right? So his kid was walking around like a monster, like stomping around. Yeah, I do remember that. His kid was like telling, telling him what to do and shit. <laughs> so the giver's talking about sameness, and he said, We relinquished colors when we relinquished sunshine, sunshine and did away with differences. We gained control of many things, but we had to let go of others. 
Mm. So in controlling the environment and controlling how people behave, they lost the light of the world. They lost enjoyment. That's one of the greatest things about the movie is that the movie, you feel the memories better than the book. Because in the movie, there is, you know, um, a cold environment. You can see his breath. You can look around at the trees and the expanse of the hill. When he and has... color, too. Yeah, when he has memories of... Um, uh, family and parties and marriages you have all this wonderful colors and, and music to go along with it but in the story it's it's just described so you don't really get the feeling the same way mm -hmm. so there was definitely aspects to it but one thing they failed on is that very near the end of the book the giver tells Jonas that there's one thing he's never shown Jonas and that's music oh shit and Interestingly enough, in the book, he actually even says, I'll give it to you like when we're done, like right at the end. The last thing I'll give you is music, but there's no time because something gets in the way. So Jonas never hears music, not Ooh. once in the story. But in the movie, there's like a whole scene with a piano and like music is like the second thing he learns. Oh. He teaches him color and then music. And that's, yeah. that's, oh, come on, man. Yeah. And also Taylor Swift's in the movie. Oh. So, yeah. Oh, is it like that Ed, Ed, is it Sheeran? Ed Sheeran? The Ed Sheeran cameo in Game of Thrones? Oh, no, that was not nearly as egregious. The Ed Sheeran one at least was, like, short, and he actually played the character. I don't know. She it uh, she was in it, and it was just... There's um there's this, not there's this pretty subpar um, movie called Skip Trace. It has uh, Jackie Chan and uh, the guy from Jackass. Steve, Steve, not Steve, no. What's his name? Help me out. Johnny Knoxville. <laughs> anyway, so there's like, they're like sitting around a campfire at the end of a party and someone starts singing Adele's Rolling in the Deep on like a mandolin. Mm -hmm. And someone starts singing along with them and the entire fucking party breaks out in a sing-song dance to Adele's song. It has... Nothing to do with the fucking scene. It has nothing to do with the movie. It just starts and it ends and it's over. And That's it's like 1950s so musical. Out of place. Yeah. Where they just like a song and then they would go back to the movie. Yeah. Yeah, that's brutal. Uh, There's actually a common theme among a lot of these books that I've been reading, and it's where a character doesn't know things, so they try and describe it in the most generic terms possible. Mm. Like, do you remember when I was talking about Frankenstein and he was mentioning that the birds were screaming at him? Right. Because he didn't have a word for birds' songs chirping. or chirping. yeah. yeah. Um, and there's a lot of good description like that where she describes things that are so alien to the character that they can't even understand them. Like, for example, Jonas tries to describe color, right? But he describes it as a quality that is not of shape or size. Well, Vsauce says that, he says, is, it, is color too complicated to explain? Or is our language not complicated enough to, to explain. explain color? Wow. Yeah. That's an interesting way to look at it. Because, well, I, that's, that's like most things, though. Even even tone or shape. If someone doesn't have feeling or sight, how do you describe shape? It's true. Uh, well, that's the idea of quanta, right? Oh. You can know every single property. So, so the idea behind quanta to give a... a the earliest example. Imagine a man that lives in a black and white room. Every single thing he sees is black and white, and mm -hmm. he has no way to see the outside world. And that man has described every single physical aspect of what creates color, the wavelengths, the intensity, everything about how color works, how color is perceived by the human eye. That man will still never understand what color is until he leaves that room mm -hmm. and actually sees it with his eyes. Oh, yeah. Same way, like you said, if you don't have the senses to be the basis for it, you have no way of even conversing on it. That was my always my issue with the way that schooling was done, is that a lot of it was they were they were just telling me what something was and not why I had to care or why it was that way. How it was relevant, especially with math. It was just like you know you do brackets first. Well, I don't like why. It's like that, that's just a rule. Well, but I, like, I just don't care. Like, why would I care about this thing? And then, and then you'd have those teachers who got it. 
Mm-hmm. And they're like, they would give you, it wouldn't be some bullshit like Apple's story about like, you know, so and so like divides the bracket. It's like, they would give me some actual reason for why you would ever want to do this thing. And then I understood it. Understanding is a completely different thing than listening. Mm-hmm. Like, I can take that information and I can tell you it back to it, you on a test, but I don't get it. I just know that the word. Yeah, and there's a lot of that. There's a lot of regurgitation that happens on tests. And so Jonas has now experienced a lot of things, but not a lot of pain. The only pain he's really had is that sunburn. So he asked, he, he wants more. So he the Jonas is pushing the giver, and the giver finally says, okay, well, I'll give you loss. So what he shows him is a scene in which um, this is actually the first time Jonas sees non-white people because he sees a scene from Africa where poachers are killing an elephant and the men are all of dark skin. And this is also the first time he sees a gun because they shoot the elephant and kill it. And he perceives all of these things. He understands what a gun is through the memory alone. And when the elephant is killed and detusked, the poachers leave and then the elephant's spouse comes out of the woodlands and like shrieks. And Jonas takes this back to his family and he's telling Lily that an elephant was a real thing because her comfort object is an elephant, right? And she doesn't believe him. She thinks he's telling jokes because she's never seen it. She's never even seen an animal. So what are the odds that an elephant would exist? And he tries to show her, but it doesn't work. He tries to like put his hands on her shoulders and like will the memory into her the way the giver did for him. And it just fails because she's not one of the pale-eyed. Mm. So it doesn't it doesn't work for her. Uh, he also talks to the giver, and the giver tells him that he was married once upon a time. That so the giver was. Yeah, so Jonas could get married. That is allowed. But imagine how brutal it would be to be married to someone and not able to tell them what you do all day long. Yeah. And, like, the things that burden you. And it would be a tremendous weight. And it just, I mean, there's a reason he's not married still. Right. Right? You know, right. he was, was married, exactly. Um, and they can't read the books. They can't do anything. They can't even go in that office of his. Mm. So his family is, you know, it's almost like, it's almost like a pet. You know, oh, I'll see right. you. I'll see you in the evenings. Like, <laughs> yeah, it would just, it would just be weird. I, but I guess the other option is live your whole life alone. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so the giver wishes he was asked more things. He wished he was consulted by the elders more often because he feels like he could make change, like make good change for oh, the okay. people. But they only consult him when they have no idea what to do, when they're totally out of options. Right. And I guess this is also something he's wishing for Jonas. He wishes that Jonas would eventually be consulted more as well. Mm-hmm. Like he just in general wishes that the people weren't so... Uh, actually, to use a word that Winston Smith uses in 1984, he calls his wife grossly dumb. Oh. And that, I think, is a good term for the people of the society. Not at their own fault, mm. but they are just grossly ignorant. And I think that he wishes that there were some opportunities that that could be fixed. Right. But they don't want that because they that don't... would... It's a lot easier to control a dumb populace. And it's easier to burden one person than the whole population. Right. But what he does talk about is that the last receiver that failed, when she was released, all of the memories went back to the people because they were no longer contained within the receiver. So there's some magic going on. Yeah. yeah. It is is literal magic. So... Oh, so they are actually taking feelings and and, and memories... Taking them from the people. Like pouring them into somebody. storing them in one person. And then she just, like, released it all back to people. Well, she had only been trained for a few weeks, maybe four or five weeks. That's all it took. That's all it she took. And and apparently the community was in total disarray when it happened. Of course. And then after a while, things slowly got, you know, back to normal. Um, and then I think the giver insults Jonas or something, and he looks to the speaker for, like, support because he expects the speaker to, like, reprimand the giver. Mm-hmm. But it just proves that he still hasn't quite got it. That he is now different. You know, the rules don't apply. You may lie. Like, you're not a normal society. You're not a normal member of society anymore. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, Jonas is still having difficulty with that. And this is what I was telling you before, how they keep saying this. Um, the giver says to him, that's right. And you will be next. A great honor. And then Jonas says, yes, sir. They told me that at the ceremony. The very highest honor. 
And this is where I feel like they must be speaking sarcastically, even right. though it's not implied in the actual text, because they're both very aware there's no honor involved. There may be um, status, there may be wisdom, but it's not, it's something they do because they have to, mm. not because they want to. Mm. And I just think it's really cool the way they keep doing that. You've been greatly honored, Jonas. Right. Right. It's it. It sounds it sounds so creepy. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like um, may the odds ever be be ever in your favor right. from the Hunger Games. They don't. Those words don't mean that. They don't mean may the odds be ever in your favor. They mean good luck. Don't die. Right. Right. Same way the you've been greatly honored means you should be happy that we fucked you. That's what they're saying, right? It's like in a war movie when they get like ambushed and there's fucking explosions going off and he's like, are you all right? And he's like, oh, I'm just happy to be here. And it's like a playful thing that is not really, it's not said in a sarcastic way, but the context makes it sarcastic and both people understand it. It's a way to uh, deal with your situation without actually getting really angry and negative about it. Mm-hmm. It's true. It's an outlet. Right. Right. Yeah. That's, that's a great, yeah. So on some days, Jonas is actually sent away by the giver because the giver is in too much pain to do a training session with him. Oh, wow. And so on those days, he would show up and the giver would be all hunched over and he would send him away and he'd say he couldn't do it. And on one of those days, Jonas is recalling the memory of warmth that he was given like on his first day of training. And he actually feels warmer. Like His body physically feels warmer when he remembers the memory. Hmm. And that's part of like this body-mind coupling thing. But he goes back to the giver and he finally says, I want real pain. Like, I want you to, because we have to start at some point. So yeah. I want to start now. And so the giver thinks about it for a while. And then he says, okay, I have an idea. I was going to read this section, but it's actually pretty violent. And he, like, vomits into his own blood at one point <laughs> and, like, snaps his leg. So I figured I would just <laughs> describe the general idea. So he's still on, so he puts him in the memory and he's on a sled but it's much, much colder outside. And the ground is not soft, it's ice instead. So as he's going down this hill, he starts spinning sideways on the sled. Oh shit. And then flies off the sled, breaks his leg, and bloodies up the side of his face from from like the ice as he slides down it. Yeah. And then when he comes to a stop, yeah, he throws up into his own blood in the snow. <sighs> and then finally wakes up. And this is where I was saying that he has this major pain in his leg and he limps all the way home. Oh no. Even though nothing actually happened. It's that it's that power of suggestion, the idea of thinking your well, leg it's, broke. It's like if you um if you put plastic wrap or let's say you put your hand in plastic wrap and you stick your hand in water. There is you could take that plastic wrap off after and there's absolutely no moisture on your hand, but it felt like your hand was in water. Oh, that's it, so true. It's, it's like it's. I've. I've it's even, so true. Have you ever had? A, I think it's called a waking dream, when you you wake up so suddenly that you that there's like parts of the dream and parts of reality are there at the same time. Yes. And you think that what was happening in the dream really happened, because I've had that before. I was like suddenly woken up one time and actually thought I believe there were actually people in my room oh. like holding me hostage. It was fucked up. Yeah, that's. And then up. I came to. And the, the the line between reality and the dream was so blurry <laughs> that I like still sat there waiting for it to like was like concrete still itself. Thought that it was happening, but didn't see anybody. And it was like I've only had that a couple times in my life, but it's it's pretty fucked up when it happens. Yeah, and I think that that's sort of the feeling. And he even thinks about the fact that he can not take any medication right mm. he's told he can't take pain medication for that yeah and he realizes that his family has never felt real pain right and he hadn't either until that moment and then each lesson after that included some form of pain so if if someone had kids i mean they're given kids right and that kid had to be released would this experience be this like sad thing or would they just be like farewell child uh, when a kid, like when a child is like, doesn't make the cut and has to be released. I mean, if you have a kid already, like let's say that, that clumsy kid. Oh, right. That mm -hmm. clumsy kid. Let's say he gets released. Is that experience for the parents? Like, 
difficult for them or are they just kind of like, well, you know? Not the loss of the kid, but the shame associated with it would be the worst part so the worst part about it is that their kid just fucked up yeah they're not they're not worried at all about their kid Mm, probably not no because they don't really have a concept of what's happening to him when he's being released yeah that's that's the weird part the disconnection is so Mm -hmm. uh so this is actually something that i thought was was kind of interesting they they talk a lot about the development of children and and like i said it's always super specific like for example the new child Gabriel was growing and successfully passed the tests of maturity that the nurturers gave each month. He could sit alone, he could reach for and grasp small play objects, and he had six teeth. So these are all these are all things that they count as, what did I call them? Tests of maturity. So they have a really rigid system for bringing a child from birth to death. Wow. None of that is up to chance the way ours is. Mm-hmm. Ours, we take you from four until 22 well 18 no, yeah, really 18, yeah. and then anything you want to do outside that do what you want to do mm-hmm. but in this society they have a plan for you the whole time and you fit that plan and you don't get a choice or you wow. get released so gabriel is doing well he's starting to develop and he's still staying with the family at this point because this is in his second year of development and this is one of the really weird things in the movie they weigh children and decide which one's heavier most time like, like a bunch of times like in the movie they're like oh this guy's heavier and they take the one off and like oh this guy's heavier and they take the heavier one but this only happens once in the book identical twins are born and that cannot fly in the society mm-hmm. because they're too identical you need to be generic but not the same because that would stand out <laughs> so what they do is they essentially, whichever one weighs the most is kept. The other one is released because they couldn't have two of the same. Whoa. Yeah. And so the father's talking about how it's unfortunate that that one has to be released, but it has to be released. And at this so point... what do people think happens when you release a baby? Who are you giving the baby to? Send it to elsewhere. Ah, yes. Of Get course. sent to elsewhere. There's oh, just wait. some like some town like underneath the town... It's the same way when you watch a Disney movie about a talking bear. You don't really think the bears talk, but you're still tricked into thinking bears are your friend, right? Not you and me. No. But most people. A lot of people. A lot of people. They're like, oh my God, like bears are so cute and and fun and cuddly. The beloved lion. Exactly. Exactly. Even the lions eat people and bears eat people. But I think it's the same way Lily was talking about. How crazy would it be if the child that got released grew up in another community and then visited this community and there was a kid that looked just like him? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think in some ways the parents actually believe that there is an elsewhere. Right. It's in but some it's ways. It's easier to believe that. It's much easier to it's believe. Like, it's like watching the news and hearing about something happening and you're like, well, you know, they had their chance. Yeah, they exactly. made their choice. Exactly, yeah. They were dealing drugs. The reason why I'm not in prison is because I just was a smart person. Yeah, I made it, better choices. It wasn't growing up in a place where I didn't have to resort to crime to survive. It was the part where I was a smart person exactly. because I'm not guilty. And if they don't, if they run, they've got to be guilty because guilty men don't... Wait, how does it go? Guilty men don't no, run? No, innocent men don't run. Innocent men don't run, of course. Yeah, that, that makes sense. That, that, I mean, hey, if you don't go on someone's show to clear your name, you must be guilty. And honestly, that's part of it. They're just, they're, it's, it's willful. They, they would rather think that. So they do think that. Right. And at this point, they move Gabriel into Jonas's room because even though he's doing well, he's still keeping the parents up all the time. Mm. So Jonas says, you know, why don't I try? Why don't I try it out? He just touches him, shows him what could happen. <laughs> and actually, what happens is that Gabe wakes up in the middle of the night and Jonas is just trying to get him back to sleep. And he accidentally imparts the memory of the warm sunshine. And he all of a sudden realizes that by giving it to Gabe, he starts to lose the memory. Oh. So he lost half the memory accidentally to Gabe. And then when Gabe woke up later in the night, he gave him the rest of the memory to keep him asleep. Whoa. Yeah. So he doesn't tell the giver this, but he goes back to the giver's room and the giver is in great pain. And he says, he says, like, here, take some of my pain. And... Jonas enters a world that I don't know what war it's from, but there's horses, so my guess is World War I. And he talks about how there's yellow and brown smoke, which to me yeah. is mustard gas. Yeah. And he talks about how 
the him and a boy next to him are both dying and the boy is asking for water and then when he gives him water the boy dies and then he lays there for hours listening to men and soldiers die this all happens in a few minutes in reality the kid sorry uh no jonas like jonas after the kid dies next to him has to sit there for hours so this is like this receiver is not just the memories of people alive it's like a pool of like all humans all generations back and back and back is what they keep saying wow yeah so they have all of the memories and this memory is so horrifying that when the giver is done he can't even look at jonas because he's ashamed that he shared that memory with him especially because why do you do it because giving it to jonas means he doesn't have it anymore Oh, right. so he's putting his problems on someone else. Well, it's not his only problem. I'm sure he has other warfare like things in his head. Seen some shit. But it was actually cool how it was done in the book where it w- or in the movie. It was unintentional. He was actually on the ground, like, reacting to the dream. He was, like, trying to save his buddy. Oh. And then Jonas tries to help him up. And when he touches him, the memory gets imparted to oh, Jonas. Okay. So it was fully accidental in the movie. Cool, but both ways work. Both ways work. I don't know. They, 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 I she, like the intentional way. Choosing though. to give it to him says a lot about the giver, and then being ashamed of it about about how he's had to help, hold on to something for so how long. Torturous it is that he finally gave it to someone else and put that problem on someone else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a tough one, and this is actually where um, where they talk more about the family and about the the adults. Uh, you know what it what it's like to have like a real family system and they start talking about how it's dangerous to allow people to make choices because they might make the wrong choices Mm. and that's the rationale that the community goes with and they talk about it in this really weird way where they're they're like yeah yeah it would be dangerous because people might choose wrong but you can tell it's almost sarcastic that they both know why that logic doesn't make sense yeah why people should be allowed to choose and then jonas stops taking his pills for the stirrings Mm. The, jo- uh, the giver doesn't tell him to do it in the book, but he does in the movie. He specifically tells him to stop taking them in the movie. These changes. I don't like them. Honestly, it seems like the person read the book and then was writing the script, but the person who got final control over the script didn't read the book. <laughs> right? It looked like they went at it and they were like, oh, this looks good, but this would be better. And without they, knowing, yeah, without yeah, yeah. knowing what they were really doing, it's like going through Huckleberry Finn and and uh, changing, like changing all the grammar so it works. Exactly, it's like that's how the fucking character talks. Exactly. If it he says it. he gon' be dead, that's how the fucking character speaks. If you change it to he will have died. It completely changes who that yeah. character is. And at one point he says, like, yeah, that weren't right. Yeah. But you can't change that to that wasn't right. Yeah. What, what it, you can't turn uh, someone from Mississippi into someone from New York and expect that the context will stay the same. What's well, like that scene in Walking Dead where he, the, the kids, the, the Morgan's kid says something like, you know, he, he weren't there. And he goes, wasn't there. Imagine if you re-read, rewrote that. So he's like, he wasn't there. Wasn't. That's like, so the, funny. What the fuck? That's so true. Well, that's where localization comes in, right? right. You really, you know, you do need to, to make it seem like it makes sense. Yeah. And this is where Jonas starts to realize that in that scene where Lily was angry at the other seven for coming and, and butting in line, she wasn't angry. She was frustrated. She never knew real anger the oh. same way they never knew real pain. Yeah. And that's what he starts to realize is how much the kids don't have, how much the whole community doesn't have. And this is when they have um, a, a random community day. Like they just have like a vacation day. They're just like, ah, everyone's off today. So Jonas goes to the park to find his friends and they're playing war Mm. and they're playing this game of war. And Jonas is so shocked by it because it's bringing him back to this memory he just got from the giver. Right. And so he tries to tell them that they shouldn't play the game anymore, but they just don't get it. They don't understand why the game is a problem. Mm -hmm. And this is where I this is where Jonas is being more and more isolated. But in the movie, they fucking ride trays down a set of stairs like you would on a sled, like a slide. And like just, just 
weird stuff and there's like these scenes where he tries to kiss Fiona that just totally doesn't happen. Weird. It's just, it's very different. Um, it's still good, but it's very different. And so he actually starts to realize that there's there's no point in talking to the other people in the community because him and the Giver are the only people that are real. No one else is a full person. You know, that, I mean, I know I probably shouldn't compare myself in this situation, but that's kind of how I feel when I talk to a normie about video game design. <laughs> a normie. And someone's like, that was a really great game. And I'm like, that's actually a poorly balanced, <laughs> shitty frame rate piece of garbage <laughs> written by monkeys. <laughs> and they're like, it got a nine on IGN. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like when people say, yeah, um, it's like, you're not real. <laughs> yeah. It's like when people just say, you know, that, oh, that movie was good. But yes, lots of things are good. But the, we have a higher standard than that now. Way it's higher. too easy to make a good movie. At the same time, it's kind of like I like the I hate everything was talking about how it's difficult for him to watch a movie without being a critic. Mm-hmm. He doesn't really enjoy them the same way he did. Whereas I can watch a movie like Assassin's Creed, which everyone said was terrible, and I actually liked it. And it was not my favorite movie. Probably not gonna ever see it again. But I was like, it was this pretty is, good. This is pretty neat. Okay. You know? I I don't think this is terrible. But objectively, I can look at it and say, like, all of these things were really weird. I don't know mm-hmm. why this was added. I don't know why that was here. It's choices. You know, like, yeah. This character wasn't really, this actor wasn't really chosen well. And yet I turned off that part of my brain. Well, I can't do that with games. No. At all. But also games are different. You feel them. Your hands are there. It's tactile. Like, kind of. I just feel like there's more engagement. There's, there's sometimes, more though, where I sure. can play a game and I'm like, this is really bad, but I'm enjoying it. Yeah, well, it's the same same way. Like, sometimes you just eat, like, a fucking hand col- a handful of Skittles and you're like, these taste great instantaneously, but I know that I'm not getting anything out of them, but I'm still going to do it. Yeah. Same way. Same way. So Jonas asked the receiver what happened to the last receiver. Or sorry, Jonas asked the giver. He says, what happened to the last receiver? Like, I want to know the real story. Mm -hmm. And he says that he couldn't bring himself to give her pain, so he focused on trying to give her, like, anguish. Oh, so he fucked up. And what he did was he gave her loss, and it made her so bitter and disconnected that one day she just left, and he found out that she'd been released. Hmm. And maybe they just told her. Or sorry, maybe they just told people that she applied. Um, maybe she didn't actually apply for release. Maybe she went and confronted the elders about something. Interesting. And they fucking glocked her. Interesting, but believe it or not, it's actually polar opposite to that. I so... really, really hope that the end of this book has the elders all walking around with like high-powered uh, handguns. Just blasting people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so... This is, yeah, so she'd been trained for five weeks when she was released. Jonas has been trained for almost 12 months at this point. Mm-hmm. So the the knowledge difference is very massive. Are we measuring his his uh, his training like a newborn child? Like 13 months? Kind of, yeah. <laughs> and then the giver and Jonas start to think about how they could go about helping the community because they both recognize that it's not a smart move for Jonas to just take over and the status quo to keep going. Mm. They both recognize that something has to change. But Jonas brought up the old receiver because he wanted to ask about release. Oh. And he says, I want to see a release because in his mind, a release is still supposed to be this wonderful ceremony. Right. And so the receiver says, you can see that. Every private ceremony is recorded, and as the receiver, you have access to all those things. So he just walks over to the speaker, and he says, I want to see this morning's release. And she says, absolutely, and starts to play it. So Jonas is sitting there watching it, and he keeps talking. He keeps saying things like, um, you know, this is the part where this is going to happen. And the giver just keeps saying, like, Jonas, just be quiet and watch. I was going to say happens. that, like, shh. Exactly. You're <laughs> watching. Like, just. So. You're ruining the film for other people. His father comes in, and this is uh, the release of the baby, um, the release of the baby twins. Mm. So he brings them in. He weighs one of them, or both of them. One weighs 
a tiny amount different, one ounce or two ounces difference. And that's the one that's a small one. So the, the larger one is given to a nurse. She takes that baby away. And then he takes the baby, he wraps it up in a blanket. He takes a syringe and he fills the syringe and then he puts the syringe into the baby's forehead and the baby starts to squirm and he says i know i know but i need a vein and the ones in your arms are too teeny weeny and then the he fuck? injects the baby and the baby just dies and then jonas goes he just killed it because jonas now knows what death is he's been in war yeah so he says like what like what's going on and then he watches and his father takes the baby puts it in a carton and then throws it down the trash chute. Holy. And that's that's release. So Why would they record that? Uh, all ceremonies are recorded. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and part of it is that they know the receiver needs to know everything in order to give them proper instructions. So that's part of it is that the right. giver is, has access to that even if the elders maybe he don't necessarily to understand how that works. Well, he needs to understand everything if he's going to properly advise. And then the giver tells the story of the last receiver. And I think this is the moment when you find out that the last receiver, her name was Rosemary, was the giver's daughter. Mm. So the giver says that on the day that she was released, the elders came to her, came to the giver and told him that she had been released and then made him watch the release. And he said he couldn't actually watch because his daughter took the syringe from the nurse and injected herself. Whoa. Yeah. So she was so disturbed by what she saw that, and she even must have known what death was. Yeah. That she chose it even knowing that it wasn't quote unquote released. So this giver guy has been through some shit. Some shit. He for had sure. He's, he's gone through a divorce and we know that's the difficult thing. Yeah. Well, his wife didn't even lose a child. Her child was released. The giver's right. child died. Right? Oh shit. So they don't even have like a bonding thing over that serious nonsense. No. So he's alone. Fuck. Totally alone. So at this point Jonas is essentially uncontrollable because he now knows his father is a murderer of children. Whether he knows it or not, his dad he, that's what he is. And he starts making, like, puns at dinner and shit like that. <laughs> Death puns. He's just like, uh, I can try not to come up with something where it's just like, blah, 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 blah. And, he, and then he's just like, oh, you don't know, know a lot about that one, Dad. Yeah. <laughs> I just honestly think he wouldn't be able to control himself. So the giver tells his family that Jonas is needed overnight for training. Mm -hmm. So that's the good and easy out. And then they stay up until the the wee hours of the night discussing what their plan will be. And this is the point where you find out that Jonas has been given so many of the memories that the giver no longer sees color. Whoa. He's given up pretty much all of his memories. The only ones he has left is music because the giver says he never saw beyond the way Jonas did. He heard beyond because he started hearing music before he started getting trained as a receiver. Mm. And uh, so he actually, yeah, he even says, I'll share the music with you. And Jonah says, no, you keep it for yourself. Wow. Because it's an unselfish thing. He wants to give her to have something left. And then they go over the plan. So this, this is like that scene in, um, in Mission Impossible where they like fucking tell you what the plan's going to be, man. <laughs> okay. So over two weeks in the moments between that, like this time and when the next ceremony of advancement will be, they plan to give all the memories of strength and courage to Jonas so that if he needs those memories, he'll have them. Then the idea is that at night, Jonas would leave his dwelling, which is a major violation. You're not allowed to be mm. out at night. He would leave his dwelling and he would drop his bike by the river along with a spare set of clothes to make it seem like he went swimming in the river. Oh shit, he's faking his own death. Yes. And then he would leave a note for his parents saying that he went for an early bike ride, which they'd be annoyed at, but not necessarily alarmed. Yeah. Then, once the ceremony was going on, there, no one would notice he was missing because his friends would think he was with his parents, his parents would think he was with his friends, and everyone else would just think he was probably with the giver, right? So no one would notice he was gone until maybe midday that day. Yeah. So when they finally noticed that he was gone, what would happen was the giver and Jonas would get a car ordered for them in the morning, 
and they would drive Jonas away from the communities first thing, as soon as they could. And then the giver would return around noontime when they discovered Jonas's things by the river. So the giver would come back to the community once Jonas had sort of escaped mm -hmm. and everyone thought he was dead. Because if Jonas gets too far from the community, very much the same way if he dies, all those memories go back to the community. So the giver is a way for the, the memories to go back to the giver. Well, no, they would be released to all the people. But the idea is that the giver would be there to guide them, to help them oh. through it. So they want to liberate the people, but also understand that you can't just throw those memories in them and then just walk exactly. away from it. Exactly. It'll be you chaos. Have, you have to control it. So the idea is that he would arrive at midday. As soon as they discovered Jonas was dead, he would go to the ceremony where everyone was already gathered and start the ceremony of loss for Jonas. And then that is where the community would move on from there. Hmm. So the idea was to bring the community together both physically and spiritually when the memories return. Wow. So it's a great plan. It really is a great plan. The thing is, Jonas really wants the giver to go with him because the giver is the only person that understands him. Yeah. Right? So he doesn't want to be alone the way the giver was. Uh, but the giver knows that he has to stay to hold, the, you know, everything together. Yeah. And then this is where their plan just totally falls apart. They're sitting at dinner, and his father says that Gabriel did not meet the standards to be given away at the advancement ceremony and will be released in the morning. Fuck. And this is like the day after they made the plan. So Jonas has no none of these memories of strength. They have no food saved up for them. They have nothing ready to go. But Jonas knows that if he doesn't take Gabriel, he'll be killed the next day. Fuck. So he grabs Gabriel in the night, steals his father's bicycle because it's the only one with a place for Gabe to sit. Oh, yeah. And then just steals food scraps from all the houses that haven't had food collection yet at the end of the night. And that's the only things that he has to set out with. Lovely. So he just leaves on his bike and just bikes away from the community. So after a while, the communities start to become further and further apart, and they're smaller and smaller when he sees them. There's tons of farmland, so they start to go out into these rural areas. Hmm. But it's still a road. He's still following a road the whole time. So they would stop when the sun came up, and they would sleep. They would eat food. They would find a place that they could like sleep in the forest until the sun went back down, and then they would continue. Oh. The reason being those jets that I told you about right. were just searching the area. So what's really kind of crazy, and this is why I really wish they had done this method. Because what actually, because it was done totally different in the movie, I'm not even going to describe how it was done because it was just like a waste of time. <laughs> but the, so when they're sleeping during the days, the pilots can't see them because they can't see any color. But the pirates, pirates, uh. <laughs> the pilots have heat sensors. They have thermal vision. Uh. So what Jonas does is he recalls memories of wind and cold and snow to reduce their body temperatures. Whoa. Yeah. So he imparts the memories into Gabriel and brings them to himself, too, so that they aren't picked up by the heat sensor. Whoa. Yeah. So that I thought was really, really cool. And then after a while, they start running out of food, and Jonas actually catches a fish with his hands, <laughs> or no, a net that he built out of, like, Gabriel's basket. Because he remembers, like, some fisherman who used to fish that way? I guess, yeah. And then they just, he takes, like, a sharp rock and cuts it open, and they just, like, eat the fish raw because mm. they can't make fire. Yeah, so it's a, it's a really daring sort of escape. Yeah. And the planes are coming all the time at first, but then after a while, they start coming less and less, and they're sweeping in these much more broad patterns. So they, either they now believe he's dead, or they don't have the resources to search right. everywhere. So he starts to see hills. The road starts going up oh, and down. Shit. It starts to rain which is the first weather he's ever seen in his life. So and it he's obviously get, makes he's, him cold and he's, miserable. He's making it. And yeah, he's, he's, and he's getting to elsewhere, right? That's where he thinks he's right. going. And he says he feels that elsewhere is not far away. And at this point, it started to snow. Oh, boy. Yeah, which is obviously not good because he doesn't have snow gear, right? Oh. He's not dressed for it. So what he does is he puts Gabriel to his, to his chest and he wraps the only blanket that they have around both of them to try and mm -hmm. keep them warm. And 
The snow is getting deeper and deeper and deeper, and he can't even bike at this point. So at one point, the bike is comes to a stop, so he hops off it and it falls over, and he briefly contemplates just falling over with the bike and just calling it quits because he's frozen and he's out of energy and they're starving because they have no food left. And at this point, all he has to do is just keep trudging get to the top exactly and at this point his memories are weak and i don't know if that means that the memories have already gone to the people if they've already started to leave his body or if he's just tired and exhausted and it's hard for him to recall the memories Mm. but they're weaker than they used to be and he's trying to use those last few moments of heat to keep them warm just to keep going and he's climbing this hill this massive massive hill and he has this feeling that at the crest of that hill is elsewhere that that's where it's going to be okay and finally finally he gets to the top of the hill and he finds a sled there the sled from the memory oh and then i'll read you so was it a memory well i'll read you how it ends and then i'll tell you what i think Downward, downward, faster and faster. Suddenly he was aware with certainty and joy that below, ahead, they were waiting for him and that they were waiting too for the baby. For the first time, he heard something he knew to be music. He heard people singing. Behind him, across vast distances of time and space, from the place he had left, he thought he heard music too, but perhaps it was only an echo. And that's how the book ends. Holy shit. So my theory is that the memories have nothing to do with location. My theory is that the memories only leave the body of the receiver when they die. My theory is that the giver knew that one way or the other, Jonas would have to die in order for this whole plan to work. Oh, so there is no elsewhere. I don't think there is an elsewhere. I don't think... And so, like like you were just asking, is it a memory or is it a whatever? Is it... So this is the only society well no there's many communities because remember he went past communities on his way out there's other communities but he's the receiver for all the communities but those communities are part of the same society yes right so like there's only one government we'll call it yes this is some sort of dystopian future where forever for whatever reason there's nothing else but there they're Mm -hmm. able to control the weather but they're surrounded by snow which means that they might be in some sort of like way future where like the early earth has frozen over and they're the only place that has stayed warm and the only way that they can control the people is by doing this. They knew that if they allowed people to live the way that they did before that it could all come crumbling down and that the giver now knew that and sent the two of them out so that he died to release, which is part of the plan. Well, one of the greatest lines in the movie, which I don't actually think was in the book, Jonah said, what is so dangerous about the idea of a sled? And the giver said, for a sled, you need snow and hills. Yeah. Snow makes it hard to make crops and hills make it hard to transport things. So if you want people to be able to abandon those ideas, you need to take the memories away. Yeah. So my theory is that it is a memory. The sled is a memory. And that when Jonas made it to the top of that hill, he collapsed and died. Well, not immediately, but he collapsed into essentially a coma of unconsciousness. Right. And the first memory he was ever given, the memory of sliding down the hill to the house, is the first thing that came back. And that's why that book ends that way. There was no real sled there. That sled is is figurative. Or the sled is from the person that he got the memory from, and they died out there too. But the memory, but then the sled would have been at the bottom of the hill, right? That's what doesn't make sense. Why would there be a sled sitting at the top of the hill in the hmm. middle of nowhere? Even if there was a house at the bottom, why would people leave their sled at the top of the hill? You bring it with you. Right. You know, you don't finish your day, walk to the he top of the also, hill, put the sled there, and then roll down the hill in your snowsuit. He never heard music. So how would he know what it's like? How would he know what music is? So and he then, was... He was believing that he had heard music because that was the only rational thing his brain could come up with. Yeah. And I honestly think that there's two moments he could have died. Either when he dropped the bike and he thought if he he felt like it would be easier to drop after it. It's possible he did. Right. It's possible he just joined the bike in the snow 
and that was it. Oh. But my theory is that in order for the memories to be released, Jonas needed to die, and that that's where he died, was at the top of that hill. So the giver really is the main character of this story because he's been playing Jonas the whole time. He might not know. He might not actually know how the that magic works because if I was setting up that system, it's sort of one of those compartmentalizing things yeah. they do where like this guy makes a widget and that guy makes a widget, but you put them together to make a bomb. Mm-hmm. I think that the giver might have actually believed because in in the in the movie there's a, a literal circle of memory. I think that's even what it's called. And there's like towers, and if you pass those towers, it immediately breaks the spell and all the memories go flooding back. They simplified it, right? They made it the way the book implied it was. Whereas in the book, it's only assumed that getting far away would diminish the effects of the memory that he has. Interesting, because if you, it would be very difficult to explain it with a movie the way that the book did, because it says, or was it just an echo? Because how do you, ex- how do you, you could have the movie end where he's walking to the top and he hears music at the bottom of the hill, but that implies that there is, in fact, another civilization. Well, what they do and it's is a happy ending. they have him come to the bottom of the hill on the sled, mm-hmm. and then he sees the home, and that's it. He knows he's home. I think the narrator even says, like, or, like Jonas's voice narrates, like, and then I knew I was home. But so the book kind of, or so the movie kind of ends happy? Well, the book does too, because in both of them it seems like he slides down a hill and there's a home there. And then, or I guess in in the book it doesn't expressly say like he finds a, a house at the bottom of the hill. Right. But it implies that he's going towards something good. And in the movie it, it's sort of the same. But when you watch the movie, he collapses on the top of a mountain essentially, on top of this massive hill. And then he wakes up and looks and sees a sled. But where he wakes up is hundreds of feet from the top of the hill. Hundreds of feet. And there's trees between him and the top of the hill. So my theory is that he didn't collapse and roll down the hill. He collapsed. into a memory. And then he's in a memory. Oh. Yeah. So they both do end in a a very similar tone that it is kind of like the Inception top. You do kind of get to choose how you feel like you want it to end. I like the consistency of the books that you're choosing, which is that they they don't just end happy. Most of them end vague or fucked up. <laughs> and the yeah. the idea behind it is much more important than the like than what the, happens. The, the adventure is the important part, not the final destination. The um uh 1984 was did not end positively. It had no. more of a message than than any of the books that we've read so far. The um, Animal Farm. Animal Farm. Um, I have no mouth. And I must scream. And I must scream. Yeah. I yeah. was fucked up. The Lorax is probably the most positive, yeah. happy thing that we've we've ever released on the, the discussion. Yeah, because the Lord of the Flies, all the kids are dead. Even some of the songs are really fucked up. Yeah, Painted Black was pretty messed up. Yeah. Um, Paradise by the Dashboard Light was really messed up the way it ends. It was long ago, and it was far away, but it was so much better than it is today. Oh, yeah. It's so sad. I forgot about that. So much sadness. Wow. I really liked this book, and, and I, I liked both read-throughs. Like, every time I read... Every time I read certain lines, the things like, every, every session after that day involved pain. Like, when you read those lines, oh. you go... Whew, what next yeah and i thought it was really cool the way jonas so it said jonas feels that elsewhere is not far away where what is elsewhere in the community the afterlife right right you send people to elsewhere when you release them and jonas felt like elsewhere was just around the corner Mm -hmm. and it was true elsewhere was at the top of that hill that's where he died and went to the afterlife that is where he found elsewhere Hmm. yeah so I'm very strongly of the opinion that he dies, but maybe that's just I got it in my head that I don't want him to live or something, and I'm just looking for it. But to me, it makes more sense that if the other girl was released and her memories were released, when Jonas is released, his memories will be released. 
I made a joke at the beginning of this, now that I'm thinking about it, that Weezer song could actually be about the giver. My name is Jonas. I'm carrying the world. Thanks for all your showness, which... I thought he said thanks for all you've shown us. <sighs> could be. <laughs> it would line up with the giver. And he says, this is how we feel. Interesting. Because it totally could be. Jonas, I don't know of Jonas as being a particular name. Like from lore or biblical references. Jonas. Yeah, honestly, from the unit in this. So those are the only two Jonases that are at least coming to my mind. That in the Weezer song. But if that's referring to the book, then. I'm looking the lyrics up right now. All right. Oh. What? <laughs> it's it was... already ruined. Oh, it's not for sure not it, eh? He says, I'm carrying the wheel. So it has nothing to do with it. Um... Huh. Please bear with us for a brief moment. Thanks for all you've shown us, but this is how we feel. Come sit next to me, pour yourself some tea, just like Grandma made when we couldn't find sleep. It's, it's a little shaky. No, well, they don't have grandmothers. It's a little shaky. Also, it talks about choo-choo trains. <laughs> Which, yeah, I don't think they have trains. They don't even have buses. If you haven't read The Giver, <laughs> it's definitely worth a read. It's only, it's 180 pages. Uh, they're not hugely packed pages. Like, Harry Potter is 200, but each page is, like, has a lot of words mm -hmm. on it. Um, and it's, it's a relatively fast-paced story. Mm. Uh, very much like... Uh, um, the most dangerous game. It doesn't really waste a whole lot of time between things. It sort of goes from important moment to important moment. And that's personally, that's how I like stories to be told. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a fan of things being drawn out. Like this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess the, the last thing to say is that the next discussion yeah. is likely to be on um, uh, a Warcraft book. Oh, yeah. Lord of the Clans. I forgot about that. Which is, uh, details the life and times of Thrall, the uh, horde chieftain of the orc people. That's exciting, because I've had that book since I was in high school and never A read it. A long time, yeah. Oh, there's another book. Day of the Dragons. You have that too? Yeah. Dude, I would totally read that. I was... Yeah, I was I wondering where, where I would find is. that. Well, we'll go digging. Yeah. But either way, Warcraft is on the horizon. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe eventually another song. And hopefully it'll be better than the fucking movie. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen it, but I'm still going to make fun of it. Me too. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for this discussion of The Giver. And yeah. please join us for the next discussion, if you will.